Hope you're all doing good today. Hope you're all doing well. Welcome back to another episode of Speed Runs from the Crypt, your bi-weekly horror hotfix. I am your host, Nick Dysis, and I have a bunch of fun games for you today. I know you're doing well. I guess this is the uh, first stream back from AGDQ. If you caught that, there was a lot of fun horror games at the event. Uh, whenever we have one of the uh, major mainline GDQ events coming up, whether it be AGDQ or SGDQ, I like to say welcome to all the new faces from the events, and I kind of like to give you a good uh, little sampler platter of what the horror block can be. So today I picked some personal favorite speedruns. Uh, they're going to be pretty fun uh, from classic horror IPs. Uh, as you can see, probably uh, over here, we're going to be having Silent Hill, Clock Tower 3, and Fatal Brain. Uh, in terms of the order, it's pretty much what you're going to be seeing here. Uh, I do want to acknowledge as well that uh, before we do begin all the games, uh, originally Clock Tower 3, I did intend to have another runner for that. However, they did need to drop out at the last second. Uh, that being said, normally whenever these things happen, uh, I try to work with the runner to get another run of some kind up for the uh, in a future show. So we'll be uh, having that. Uh, anyway, that being said, how about we get on started? We're going to be having Silent Hill 1 any percent with Punchy. Take it away. Right, hello everyone. I'm Punchy, this is Silent Hill 1 Classic Speedrun. Classic PlayStation 1 horror stuff. What button do I have bound to the start? No, it's square. Okay, thank you. Three, two, one, play ball. This, uh, this game has fully rebindable controls, and I always forget what I had my buttons set to last time I play it, because I change every single time I like, pick the game back up again for some reason. It's a thing. Anyway, this is any percent, so we're going to be seeking the fastest ending. We will discuss what ending types are when the branch points actually occur. But for now, in the intro, our first order of business is to chase after Cheryl into a back alley. Cheryl? Cheryl? Is that, is that Cheryl? Cheryl? Now, the voices are all sped up because I'm playing this under fast disk speed, which is a common PS2 option for speedruns that enable PS2s to run PS1 games with uh, lower loading times. But in Silent Hill 1, it has the funny side effect of making all of the dialogue play way too quickly. Doesn't do anything else to the run, it's just that. It's the only thing. If you start this cutscene from outside uh, the pavement, Harry will run into the alleyway and that saves like a second. Tiny optimizations already occurring here. Silent Hill 1 at the, at the, at the highest level of play is tons of really, really minor things like that. And they're interesting, so I'll, I'll try to uh, to sweat the small stuff. But at the same time, this is we're just here to like chill, you know. Something weirdly relaxing about Silent Hill ones for Silent Hill one runs for some reason. He pulls out his lighter, and now our goal will be to die as soon as possible in the intro. The only way to get out of the, the nightmare segment is to die. What is this? What is this? What's going on? What's going on? So we're gonna try and sideways strafe into an enemy and hopefully get grabbed. Nope. Dead RNG. Whether or not you get grabbed straight away is random. You wanna get grabbed straight away, and if you don't, you lose a couple of seconds. Realistically, runners just reset to that over and over again, looking for like the good start. But we don't have time for that today. Equip the gun straight away. And we do need to pick up, we don't need to pick up the health drinks, but they're very difficult to avoid and provide a, a little bit of safety during the run. But we do need the knife. We need the knife, the radio, and the map. The game will not let you proceed unless you pick up those items. What's that? Huh, radio. What's going on with that radio? Radio. What's going on with that radio? Our first enemy, the air scream, is going to burst through the window. We're just going to gun it down straight away. How many bullets this takes is random. That is a six shot, which is on the high end. I think the range is... Is it four? Is it three or four is the lowest? I forget. But uh, it's four. a random. Four sounds right. Let's go with that. I believe it's four to six. It's random. It's not a big deal, but it is a small deal. All right, so now we take off. We're looking for the keys to the eclipse. The first major puzzle puzzle that we have to solve is looking for three keys to open a door to someone's back garden. 
And uh, you don't need to actually go to the door and pick up the map that shows you where the keys are before you can collect them. They're just scattered about the environment. So if you know where to go, you can just go straight away. There's one key. So in this outdoor area, it is about managing aggro. We can generally avoid most enemies in the early game by just sort of taking the particular routes that we do, but we need to pay attention to, like, the sound of the radio, because enemies in this game have a wide degree of patrolling area, and they're kind of random too. So sometimes the unexpected can occur. We're going to pick up the second key in an abandoned cop car, and this guy is going to be hanging around having fun. I'm out of here. But what is he doing? Okay, he just missed us clean. Sometimes that guy can take a very intelligent line straight for your face. And you do not like that. That is time loss. And you take damage. You do not have infinite health, obviously. Stick into the inside here. We're trying to avoid picking up aggro from another air screamer on the right side of the street here. But we very likely will not be able to avoid taking aggro from this guy near the third key. He is already disturbed. Quick turn. And where is he at? Aha! Miss. Swing and a miss. He tried. He tried his best. But uh, I swerved around to try and avoid the blow. And now, we're going to hug the left side of the street here, while we uh, head all the way up to collect a note. Normally, Silent Hill doesn't make you collect notes to figure out things if you know the item is there, but this is an exception. We cannot pick up an item in a dog kennel unless we find a note that tells us, look in the dog kennel, stupid. He doesn't literally say it. I'm taking liberties here. I've speed ran this game so much that I don't remember what the letter actually says. It doesn't matter. All the way at the end of this street. We're going to try and stop directly on top of the note. Like that. Very good. So you can't stop on a dime. In this game. It's not quite like a Resident Evil where it's very responsive and like when you press, when you stop pressing forward, Harry will stop immediately. It doesn't work like that. Harry controls like a car. He has like a braking distance. So that little stumble forward that he does... It has to be accounted for when you want to stop on top of an item after running. Like, for instance, I'm going to turn a little and then release. That results in Harry coming to a stumbling stop in front of the door. If you keep holding forward there, what will happen is you'll bonk the door instead. You'll run straight into it and you lose time because you won't be able to open the door when you're crashing your face into it. Asterisk, except when you can. Like that. That door doesn't care if you bash into it, some of them do. Silent Hill 1 is a game of doors. You must understand doors deeply in order to speedrun Silent Hill 1. Every door behaves differently, their characteristics must be learned and memorized. You must understand the greater theory of doors. You must also understand the greater theory of light. Light in the nighttime areas is important because when flashlight on, enemies will target you more frequently. But flashlight off and they can't see you, but flashlight off and you can't see what you're doing. So you need to memorize the maps fairly well when doing this, because there is an airstreamer on the right side of the road right now, and having the light on will result in you becoming a target of that. I can turn it on now, though. We are good until we reach the next major area, the school. I have a habit of referring to, like, the, the individual areas of Silent Hill as dungeons. Such is my extremely RPG logic. So here's a funny characteristic. This door, if you just run straight forward, Harry will do a little walk towards it. But it, he won't do as much of a walk if you use the analog stick when running forward. Now we're going to dodge an enemy, turn left, turn right, and then turn left again. That's a dodge. Uh, we, we keep our light on there on purpose in order to manipulate the enemy's, like, attention towards a certain direction, so we can sort of bait them into turning too strongly, and then we can maneuver around them. That's the technique. A 
pick up the chemical. Yet you can't use that here because... <clears throat> Not close enough, huh? If you say so, man. Now we turn our flashlight off on the way back, and then we can pit by the enemy on the right side. So whether or not you're coming into a room or out of a room affects whether or not you keep the flashlight on or off for certain dodges. And the first medallion is inserted. You have to in insert the medallions one at a time. You can't, like, collect both and then do them. Do the dodge again. This guy's spawning positions a little nice on the left side, that's fine. That's pretty standard, but that guy can be in a variety of places, and some of them can be rather inconvenient. Piano puzzle. Dang. We need to hit the keys that don't make noise. But a trick for any segment in this game that involves a cursor on the screen, using the analog stick moves the cursor faster than the D-pad. Do not know why, it's just like that. So if you use the analog stick, you save a little time. Unlock this door. Now, walk one step, then turn your flashlight off, then bank for the corner. That is the safe way of approaching that. Turn flashlight off again to not drag her as we curve through two dudes. And now we can accomplish turning on the generator, which will grant us access to the clock tower. I think it's a clock tower in the courtyard. I'm waiting for an audio cue there to quick turn. You don't, in you don't immediately have control of Mason. So far, so good. No grabs. Looking strong out the gate. we enter the Nightmare School. Where the enemy density gets a bit higher. We need this card. Very easy to not pick up this card and instead, like, activate every text box around it. Now, for this dodge, turn flashlight up before entering the room, run forward, and hope for the best. That's really the whole strat here, is just run forward and hope these guys don't get in your way. Like this, what are you doing? <laughs> Swipe me once and then loses interest and walks away. Thanks, man. What a comedian. And now we're going to collect the shotgun. This is this is the only weapon we collect in the entire game. Yeah, that's right. I was like thinking, is that true? Uh, the shotgun is actually the highest damaging weapon in the game, but only if you're point blank. If you're not point blank, then it's not. But we want to do maximum damage, and the best way to do that is to get close to our enemies and blast them with the shotgun, so we don't need any other guns. like the rubber ball. Oh, as a sidebar, I'm playing the Japanese version of the game, but it isn't actually any faster to do that. It's just cheaper and I can read the language, so I do. Just because that's like one of the most common questions I get asked about this when I stream. As you know, why do you, why do you play the Japanese version rather than the American version? Because like, I'm not American. But if you do happen to have the American version of the game kicking around, uh, there are no meaningful differences that would prevent you from doing the speedrun. It's just language. Doesn't matter. We turn this valve to wash a key down this pipe, and we can get it later. We need two keys to complete the Nightmare School.
going to approach this door at kind of a sideways angle. This is a doorway, if you run at it straight on, you'll bonk off it instead. So you have to take a particular angle when doing that. Again, doors and their properties in this game, very finicky, very individualistic. You cannot simply, you cannot take it lightly. You must respect every individual door and their preferences. That is interesting movement. Lodge through the middle of this room so nothing grabs me. Cool. Collect this box of shotgun shells. We only collect two boxes of shotgun ammo in the entire game. We get through this on a pretty trim inventory limit. This game doesn't have a limited inventory, but we, you know, it's a speedrun. We try to collect the absolute minimum. If you don't need it, don't pick it up. So far, so good. Learning to how to control Harry is a thing that takes some time when you run this game. It's not quite as simple as just, like, run in the direction. Even if you think you're used to tank control, Silent Hill 1 has kind of acquired tank controls, even by the standards of the genre. It's very heavy. Turning is very delicate. But that's us getting through the first major area without getting grabbed, so that's pretty good. Looks like it's running at 60 times. Is this an emulate improvement? No, this is real hardware. Silent Hill 1's frame rate is just really inconsistent. Ooh, my, too uh, much strafe. my favorite fact about the frame rate is that later on in the game, there's gonna be a room that's a, like at single digit FPS. <laughs> yeah. And you'll you'll see it, we'll point it out, but uh it's a funny room. There's 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 one room that runs at like a perfect perfect 30 and one room that runs at like two. It's, it's amazing. Uh, you will see the snow falling frame by frame and it's kind of great. I need a boss fight. Rude. Very rude. Bruh. Okay, so this is split head. We're gonna fire four shots and that gets him to phase two, and then we're gonna wait for him to open open up. Fire two shots in, and that's a kill. If you get caught by the mouth closing, you die instantly. So you gotta make it right. I had to use an extra shot there because he started really far back, which is annoying. Yeah, not too complicated a boss fight, fortunately. And that's the score. Ideally, you'd like him to spawn a bit closer to you so you can, you know, not use an extra shot. That's all right. Uh, minor thing I'm doing, every time I quick turn, I'm actually holding down the walk button because for some reason holding down the walk button expands the frame window to hit a successful quick turn. If you do it while not holding walk and therefore having run as your default, it's really tight. You have to be like spot on. So uh, I'm holding down triangle and then tapping L1 and R1 at the same time every time I want to do that crazy high APM gameplay. Okay, back on the streets of Silent Hill, we're now headed towards a church. Because we heard the bell going off. Where's this guy? He's behind me. Interesting. What are you doing? What are you doing? He's trying. He's up to something. He's having a great time. 
Oh, he, oh, he's still, he's in pursuit. Oh, baby, I got two of them. This is a rare situation. They're like in each other's way. Okay, that was... Nope, there he is. Mm -hmm. Are you okay? Can I help you? No? Okay, thanks, man. <laughs> that was deeply unusual. So those guys can, like, they swarm around you. They do actually attack you, I promise. Uh, and that is bad if they do, because then you take damage and you stumble in place and what have you. Whereas, uh, that was an extremely unusual pattern. I wasn't really sure what to even make of that. Ah, bonk the chapel room door. That's what I mean when I say if you bonk certain doors, they won't let you through. That one, no good. Didn't take it tightly. The angle has to be right. Gotta, gotta learn the quirks of doors. He was trying to sell me something. They were, they were up to something. The Air Screamer crew was up to something there. They were having a great time. Very unusual group of dudes. Right, we're coming up on uh, the fable, the controlled, the control tower with its fabled two FPS. This is one of the hardest bits of movement in the game, purely because the game runs so poorly while you're doing it. Okay, got in there. I'm gonna pop the heel now. Yeah, look, you look at the snow in the background as like as we lower the bridge. You can see it like falling bit by bit. It's yeah. grim. I'm it's so grim. Like what? Hanks, the FPS in that room is like just the bridge. It's the bridge. It's the bridge model. Because it's actually pretty big. But yeah, that that room is it has genuinely very difficult to execute movement because it runs at like three FPS. It's incredible. It's real easy to get hung up on like any corner in that room. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. PS One games, classic stuff. Okay, we're heading into the uh, the second major area, the hospital. And the hospital is where we'll meet a new enemy type, the nurse. And their slightly upgraded counterpart, the doctor. Nurses are an obstruction to the run because they have a, a grab when they get up close. This grab doesn't actually do any damage, but grab make you slow. And that bad. This is where an ending branch point happens. So I mentioned this is any percent. Any percent uh, new game is where we attempt to get one of the four standard endings from new game. So UFO ending is out because you can't get it without going through new game plus, and that would make it a different category because new game plus unlocks yada yada yada, blah blah blah. Standard stuff for speedruns. But of the four standard endings, the fastest is the bad plus ending. And one of the prerequisites is that we collect a plastic bottle from the hospital and use it in this room. Nice and center. To scoop up red liquid in this room. So that's prerequisite one done. Now, the red liquid is actually a gleopahotis. However, a, a glophidus, I think, is how it's pronounced. It is, a, it is a liquid with demon exorcism properties. I think it's made of a flower. I forget what the lore on this is. You think I would have this memorized by now, but I really don't. It's a law thing. Play the game. It's all written there. But okay, first thing we got to do in the hospital once we've accomplished our little side objective is go to floors two and three and discover they're both locked. Can't do nothing here. Rubbish. But then a fourth floor appears. The fourth floor. Oh. There we go. Missed the door by like a hair. Yeah, that uh, that little optional objective that we accomplished will end up making it faster later on for us because we can do uh, we can do a glitch with it. We can do a glitch with it. 
And it's a doozy. Look forward to that. Yeah, there are four endings. There's just the bad ending, the flat-out worst ending. You got nothing good. You fail, you smell. Try again. Bad plus, where, like, you manage to accomplish one of the, the little side objectives. Uh, and the good ending. The good ending is its own category. Uh, this is any percent, so we're aiming for the fastest ending. That was good luck, by the way. That nurse can sometimes be blocking the door. And be very annoying about it. But we got through smoothly. There's the doctor. The doctor is like a nurse, but he hits slightly harder. We're trying to collect four tablets to open a door. Very horror game type puzzle. Four colored doohickeys, that what which opens a door. No UFO category? There's a UFO category as well. It's considered a New Game Plus run. You can use New Game Plus items. Because there is a New Game Plus weapon. It's not like a rocket launch or anything, it's a laser gun. And it is very powerful, but it's a little complicated to deploy. Anyway, walk into this room. You only have to take one step into this room before you're allowed to use the blood packet to distract these little tentacles from the green tablet. But you do have to take one step. You can't just do it from standing. Yeah, once again, use the analog stick for faster cursor movement. Once we get through this, we'll be doing a trick called Nurse Push. It's where you push a nurse. We're very descriptive over here in the Silent Hill community. A nurse blocks a door. We want her out of the way. The best way to get her out of the way is to push her, but also shoot her in the process. And then we can slip through. Yeah, nice. Very good. So get up close, push her a little bit, and then fire two shots with the shotgun and swoosh on through. Uh, that is actually a lot harder to execute properly than I think I just made it look. Because if you wait too late to start doing the shooting, she'll grab you. And if you, you start shooting too early and, you know, don't push her back far enough, you don't get through. So that went well. It is very easy to get blocked by the nurse there and lose, like, ten seconds. And ten seconds is a lot of time in a Silent Hill 1 run. This game is, like, very, very optimized at the top level, so if you fail that, people just reset over it instantly. This is the room where the frame rate suddenly increases to a solid 30. The high FPS burning room. Wow. Please enjoy these frames. I mean, he's not, he's not moving right now, so... Frames. It's so smooth. And back to your regularly scheduled approximately 20 FPS. this what's this collect a funny key it takes a bit before the key will actually be able to be picked up it's like loading the sudden smoothness we're back to the smooth room with 30 fps and we're back out curses there's the second box of shotgun ammo that's the last one we're getting for the rest of the run Provided I have managed my resources correctly. Can I get through the corner here? Yeah, nice and smooth. Taking that corner that tight... That was a really good bit of movement as well. Uh, taking that corner tightly is fast but scary, because if the doctor is too close to the corner, then you'll get blocked by them when you try and squeeze past, and they'll probably stab you in the process. And doctor stabs are very damaging, so it's risky. I call that the dock block. Okay, we've grabbed the antique key, the antique shop key, and we're going to head over there. It's on the other side of town. This is where a new enemy is introduced, although they don't really show up. Like, we're going to navigate around them. 
There's an enemy called the Romper. It's a kind of monkey-like enemy that does big leaps and will eventually try to latch onto Harry's back and knock him over. Those enemies are actually key to a glitch. Yeah, right now they're on, like, the other side of this road, and I'm going to sort of take a line such to not draw their aggro, because in, in daytime environments where uh, the cover of darkness doesn't obstruct the player, they're very, very aggressive and hard to shake. So you'd rather not deal with that. In night environments, they're basically blind, so it makes it a lot easier to deal with. But the glitch comes from the fact that if a romper jumps onto Harry Mason's back and knocks him into a loading screen, like a walk-off loading screen rather than like a door, uh, the resulting displacement of Harry being knocked over but then also put into a loading screen results in a sort of... It's hard to... I don't really know how this works on a technical level. But the basic... The end result is that where Harry is and where the game wants him to be are not the same. Uh, the end result of that is that Harry can walk through walls. But it's very challenging to execute because it relies on the enemy AI, which is in no way reliable. So we are going to try to bait a romper into jumping on us to knock us down this flight of stairs. So run out. Quick turn. Walk into the corner. Oh, too fast. That looks good. Clean. And now this door, we walk straight through it. I didn't open the door, I walked through it. I am now uh, walking in the void. There I am. There's Mason. Uh, I am now walking some ways above Silent Hill. Like, just on, like above it, on top of it. My goal is now to fall back down. Fortunately, this is remarkably easy. Mm. And there I am. I'm now on the roof uh, adjacent to the hospital. Our goal there was to get back to the hospital. I actually just skipped a boss fight by doing that. There's normally a boss fight against a, uh, a centipede-type enemy. Actually, it's a caterpillar, isn't it? It turns into a butterfly. Anyway, there was a boss fight there. It's gone now. Uh, I skipped it. By skipping straight to the hospital, I don't have to do that fight. That skip is very, very hard to do. I am perfectly happy with second try. No problem. Uh, it relies on the enemy AI, so even people who are really, really good at it, you just don't get it every time. It's just not possible. Sometimes the AI is just doing its own thing. Anyway, time to fight Float Stinger. So this boss, you have to not dump your shots because when you attack it, it gains, like, a brief amount of damage resistance every time you do it. So you need to space your shots out. Where am I? Hello? I'm losing track of things a bit here. Don't stab me. He's stabbing me with his butt. Okay. If you just relentlessly dump ammo into that fight, you'll find you'll run out of ammo really, really fast. So you want to space your shots out, but also be as close as possible to deal maximum damage. So you have to kind of feel out the timing of when is optimal to fire again. Because obviously you want to kill as fast as possible, because, you know, speed running. But we only have so much ammo, and we would like our shots to be as efficient as possible. That is a fight where it's very hard to concretely explain what you should do. You have to kind of feel the timing. That went well, for what it's worth, other than getting hit in the face twice. That is less than ideal, because that actually does quite a bit of damage. Just to be ultra safe, actually. Oh no, I'm green. Wasn't as risky as I thought. I checked my health because I thought it would be lower than that, but it's not. It's fine. Because there is a random chance that I can take some damage in the sewers, and if I was, like, in critical condition, there is a chance that I might die, and that'd be bad. Because I'm on a marathon. But no, we're doing fine. We're fine. 
Okay, sewer dodge. How these work depends on what you can hear. You must hear. This first dodge, if you hear nothing, it hasn't moved, and so you have to take it from the inside. If you do hear something, it is moving, so you can take it from the outside. I hear nothing. Yep. Hear nothing, hasn't moved. Take it on the inside. Second dodge, same kind of deal, but reverse the two. I hear nothing. Go outside. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's how it works. Trust your ears. Because those enemies can sometimes aggro earlier or later. So if you hear them already moving around, you can make a reasonable judgment about where they might be. But if you hear nothing, they haven't moved from their starting position. So that's how you know which way to turn, despite not being able to actually see them, you can hear them. Now, dodge number three on the way back is up to God. Because doesn't matter what you can hear. Have fun. Extremely cringe. That third guy just does whatever he likes. That guy's not even awake. See you later. One hit's not bad. You could do much worse. Turn the flashlight off here for a little bit to not disturb these cockroach enemies. That guy takes a swipe at me and misses. What an idiot. I like to highlight all of these little nuances of how dodging works and how you know to do certain things, because Silent Hill 1 is actually a very random run. But at the same time, it's also a very consistent run, despite that. Which is weird. Like, I think it's a very approachable speedrun to pick up. But at the same time, there are a lot of bizarre fine details. That people have been gradually labbing out over the course of, like, the decades that the game has been out. I'm going to let go of forward about here and crash my face into the door anyway. Uh, the idea there was to come to a stop directly in front of the door instead of smashing my face into it, but the timing on that is difficult. Is it hard not to bump into walls? Very. Okay, maybe not very. Let's not, like, oversell it. Headphone fell out. But, uh, the controls take a bit of getting used to, definitely. If you approach doors, like, kind of flat on, like, straightforward, you're very often going to bonk straight into them without opening them, so you learn to take doors at kind of more of a side angle, like this. I'm going to sort of turn into the corner a bit instead of approaching them straight. Because if I approach it straight, Harry won't open it properly. That guy's got straight out of the way. Great. Thanks a bunch, pal. Uh, getting through that final door there can be challenging sometimes because that final dude likes to act like a gatekeeper. He is the keeper of the sewers. You must answer his three riddles in order to escape. Uh, but sometimes he just runs straight forward and you get a free buy on that. So that's nice. Now we're in the resort and I'm going to run forward with my flashlight off so you won't be able to see anything. We're trying to avoid drawing the aggro of the romper enemies. Who, like I said, if they do catch... Catch a uh, sight of Mason are very hard to shake and very aggressive at that. So keeping light off until I have successfully got past them, which is about here, is the best policy. If you were going for the good ending, this is where you would do that. There's a whole like little side quest you can undertake in this area that unlocks the good ending, but this is any percent, so we are not bothering with that. Same deal, flashlight goes off because we are trying to evade the notice of rompers. Frame rate's gonna tank as I run past here because there is a romper nearby. Yep. That's how you can tell whether or not the romper has spawned near you or not, is whether or not the frame rate tanks. Very funny. But we're past it now. 
you can tell you're past it when the frame rate recovers. Now, as we approach the boat area, there's this air screen, but did the dog spawn in or not? Uh, no, it didn't. Sometimes there's a dog there. I honestly couldn't tell you why it's there sometimes and why it's not. I don't think it's meant to be random. It just sometimes isn't there. Uh, this is another case where using analog stick prevents Harry from walking when he gets close to a door. Sometimes you just want to use the analog stick to run instead of D-pad because for whatever reason, uh, Harry won't, like, bonk a door if he does. No idea why. It's just a thing. It's a very bizarre quirk of the speedrun. Because, like, you don't actually move faster whether or not you use uh, the D-pad or an analog stick, but Harry's, like, gait changes. If that, like, the, the, the number of steps he takes is different. It's it's odd. It's, it's a very, very weird peculiarity. Get Mason, please, get on the stairs. I got on it and then it, like, pushed me off. Weird. Yeah, we're doing a, a lighthouse run in the dark. I'm stuck on something, hello? I think the enemy was in the way. I'm gonna try and stop running before I touch the lighthouse door, just like that. A little too far out. You wanna be right in front of it so you can just use it instantly. And now the spiral staircase. If there is any type of environment more uniquely poorly suited to tank controls, it's a spiral staircase. So I'm having to, like, walk to reorient Harry as I try and uh, move around the thing. Because if you just run straight, if you keep holding, like, up in a direction, eventually Harry will be facing completely perpendicular to the wall and will just smash into it. And you don't want that, so you got to sometimes walk and turn around. <laughs> Very cool. Unfortunately, the game doesn't make you do the entire run back to the boat. It just teleports you once you get to that, like, invisible threshold on the ground. And now we're off to the amusement park for fun and games. Let's see, the dog spawned this time on the way out. Ooh, you almost blocked me. Tricky. Tricky guy. Okay, to the second sewers. The second sewer segment is quite a bit briefer than the first one, fortunately. But we got to cross a sewer again to get through to the amusement park. This first dodge is random. Hopefully the enemy doesn't get in our way. It did. Incredibly rude of him. But he didn't take a swipe, so that's good, I guess. He just decided to stare at us. He just wanted to say hi. Okay, so now I'll be doing the red liquid glitch once I get through the sewers. The red liquid is normally an item you use on the boss of the amusement park area in order to skip the fight and save the character, because it's like a character who's possessed by a demon or some such. And you use the red liquid to exercise them and save their life. But there is a bug in early print runs of the American version and the Japanese version that allow you to use the red liquid on a random, not normally an interactable ghost baby enemy. And the game will count that as though you have used the red liquid on the boss, thus immediately skipping the entire segment. That's good. But what happens when you actually do it is this. Uh, normal things are occurring. <laughs> Mason briefly key poses to assert authority. It's just how it is sometimes, you know? You ever go to a merry-go-round? This is what it's like. <laughs> Extreme merry-go-round. My favorite fact is that this behaves differently depending on the version of the game. If you play this on PSP, if you play it on PSTV, you get different results for Harry's random flailing. 
Like, it's, it's truly deep in the weeds. Like, the game has no idea what's going on at that moment. But that, that glitch skips the entire amusement park area and a boss fight, so very impactful. And that is why pursuing the bad plus ending is fastest, because that, that still satisfies the criteria for one of the, uh, the, the plus part of the ending. So we're now in the bad plus ending, as opposed to just the regular bad ending. So despite it being a little bit of an interlude to pick up the necessary items, it ultimately saves time to pursue a slightly better ending. Ever so slightly. I couldn't tell you who found the red liquid glitch because honestly, it's older than time. It's, it's one of those glitches that like, it felt like it was all over the internet before I even had the internet, you know? I'll say right now, because I used to actually keep a, a lot of track of the history of Silent Hill 1 speedrunning, weirdly enough. Uh, it was known since uh, Twin Galaxies. <laughs> wow. Which, since for those of you who don't know, um, a lot of speedrunning happens on speedrun.com. Before that, you had Speedrun's Archive. Even earlier, it was Twin Galaxies, and it was known literally since the game came out in, like, 1999. Yeah, this that's it's been known since, like, before the turn of the millennium. Yeah, and then it ancient, ended up ancient tech. I think there's actually like a Japanese version of the game that actually patches it out. Yeah, you have to be careful when buying it. If you if you buy like a what is it, Konami the best version, the re-release, it's patched. Yeah. Like it was known uh, really early by quite a lot of people. Uh, funny enough, though, a lot of the earliest runs of Silent Hill 1 didn't actually use the glitch because this is back when uh, a lot of people were like, "Oh, glitches are cheating," so they didn't. Uh, yeah. They didn't start using it until uh, people moved over to Speed Demo's archive. This is like the one little bit of information I have about Silent Hill 1 that I can help with. Cheers. So I've, I've been running Silent Hill 1 for, I think, about... I think it's been a decade. I think it's actually been a full 10 years. Close to it at this point. I feel like the last time I said this was a couple of years ago. So, uh, math. I've been running this game for a very, very long time. And the, the red liquid glitch has been there since I first picked the game up. So it's been known for at least a full 10 years, approximately. Like, much longer than it's been there from the very, since time immemorial, ancient technology. It has been known for at least 24 years. So there are posts in the forums on uh, Twin Galaxies that say this, <laughs> and I have seen them physically. Uh, this game's this game's like history of speedrunning is like super old. People have people have been at this one for a very long time. Ah, do the puzzle. I missed the top right. Yes, okay, we're in we're in nowhere now. We're in the final area. It's kind of a remix of previous areas, but they don't connect together in a way that makes spatial sense. Uh, they're, they're arranged together in impossible ways. We are going to... This isn't quite a nurse push. This is just a nurse go away. We're just going to shoot this one twice so it gets out of the way. He would like it to not be there anymore. Thank you. We're trying to collect five key items now because we need five items to unlock the final door and take on the final boss. Turn a little bit. Nah, still give me a little walk. There's a thing where Harry will walk towards objects of interest when he gets too close. I call it proximity walking. I don't know if anyone else calls it that. That might just be a me thing. Uh, and you want to avoid this proximity walking because walking slow, you'd rather run into what you're trying to use have to use the ring on this fridge to do up the chain, otherwise when, when you take the sword and strafe away, uh, a horrible tentacle bursts out of the fridge and kills Mason instantly. If you lock it, proceed as normal. Uh, and now Mason will fail to open a bag of jelly beans. Like a child. It and he just rips it open. But fortunately, there was a key inside, so it wasn't a, a complete waste. <laughs> Why does he do that? 
just he just can't open this bag of jelly beans and just gets them everywhere. Sometimes your hand slips. <laughs> okay, now we're going to turn off power. There is a key that you cannot take because power is coursing through it. It's like attached to wires. Turn to the left. Don, don, go. Nice. Works every time. That's a timing thing. You have to wait a certain amount before you start running, otherwise you'll get grabbed on the way. Uh, I always do this by turning a little bit and then saying Don Don out loud. For some reason, it never works if I don't do that. Whatever it is, that's just how I've acquired the timing for that dodge. It's going well, though. It's a no-grab nowhere, actually. Actually, I think it's been a no-grab game. I don't think I've gotten grabbed by anything. It's not bad. But, okay, final boss. Use our five items. And we open the way to the final boss. The final boss... Uh, we're going to kill it very quickly because speedrunning. But it takes triple damage when it's charging up lightning. Uh, this was a strategy that wasn't widely known until I bought a Japanese strategy guide and translated it. I mean, I didn't translate everything, I just translated that bit. So you want to get close, but without, like, bonking. This'll do. Wait. And then when they start gathering lightning, fire away. And that's time. That's time. That's time. I killed them in five. Good final boss. Yeah, I bought the, uh... Too far away, I can't reach over. Headphones, too attached. No! Uh, a Japanese strategy guide, an officially licensed one called the Silent Hill Perfect Navigation Book, and it describes this weakness in the strategy guide, and <laughs> none of, uh, none of the English-speaking speedrun community apparently knew this until I had a gander at the book, so that's fun. It made the good ending run way more consistent, because we were completely wigging it on that guy before. Now, Silent Hill 1 runs go off the in-game timer, so we'll have to wait a little bit here to see after some of the unskippable ending stuff. But it will play the ending theme way too fast. Extremely sped up guitar. Now, nah, skip that. Yeah, I've been Punchy. If you uh, enjoyed this run, drop me a follow up my Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash punchy. I do speedruns of Silent Hill. Uh, not just Silent Hill 1, I run pretty much all of these games, I think. And other horror accoutrements, I run over 100 games as of late. Uh, not quite as impressive a figure as Ecdysis, I forget what he's up to nowadays, but... I think it's like 180-ish. God, how do you do that? Terribly. Still, it's a big number. It's a triple-digit number. I'm, I'm pleased with myself. It's, it's not all number. horror games, but it's a lot of horror games. Sometimes and I run no. RPGs and platformers, it's, it's a lot of stuff. I run a lot of video games. And if you want to run this game, the Silent Hill Community Discord is the place to go. It is linked on the speedrun.com leaderboard. There are a lot of very knowledgeable people in there who will help you with you know, any aspect of learning the game. There's a lot of there's a lot of big thinkers. <laughs> people who know all kinds of things that I really don't. There are there are there are a lot of strong players out there. 3112, that is a fine time. Alright, GG, good stuff. Thank you again for doing the run. Uh, before we do hop on off uh, to the next run, you have anything else you would like to add in? I think I did my shoutouts during the ending. Yeah, that's what I figured. Is anything else just in case? Well, it's been it's been great. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thank you once again for doing the run. Uh, Punchy is a, a frequent runner of the show. Does does a lot of games that are quite fitting. So it's always a nice time. Uh, that being said, if you have not checked them out, definitely do so. You can find the link in chat, and you can. Uh, uh, probably check them out on YouTube as well under the same name. Uh, anyway, we do have a couple more games for you tonight. So don't go anywhere. We will be right back with Clock Tower 3. All right, everyone. Welcome back from the break. Uh, hope you're doing good. And hope you enjoy that run of Silent Hill 1. Uh, our next game, I'm pretty sure we're just on the game screen at this point, probably because I'm uh, also running the game. Are we doing Clock Tower 3 next? 
I didn't mention in the beginning, and for anyone coming in, I do want to mention it again. Originally, I was not planning on doing the run for this game. However, uh, one of the upsides of Speedruns in the Crypt is that very often whenever runners need to drop out for whatever reason, it's not normally a problem because I can tend to fill in. Um, anyway, uh, that being said, uh, today uh, we're going to be having Clock Tower 3. It's a pretty neat game if you've never seen it. Uh, I'm going to be a runner, I'm McDysis. Not only am I going to be running this game, but also I run Speedruns in the Crypt the show. So if you've been liking the shows, then thank you. Anyway, if we're ready on time, we begin in a moment here. Uh, let's go... Three, two, one, go. So, Clock Tower 3. What is this game? What are we doing here? Uh, this game is one of the games in the Clock Tower series. It is when Capcom got a hold of it. And as well, we're going to be taking a look at a game that controls quite similarly to a lot of PS2 horror games you might be aware of. Uh, we're going to be having our character here. Uh, it's going to move... Uh, I think the answer is directionally, so I'm just kind of give the idea of what kind of game it is. And unlike a lot of other horror games, we're not going to be having a lot of enemies, but we're going to be having to manage stalker enemies. So just kind of give a taste of what this game uh, gives. Uh, also, I ended up counting uh, during the break, but I run 182 unique games. Some more than others, but I tend to have that many in my roster at a time. I suppose it works quite well with how we've set up the show here, but uh, I like horror games. It's a fun genre of games. Uh, we will be in a clock tower at one point during the game. Uh, as well, I do normally talk to chat while doing these, so if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, anyway, to kick things off, we're going to be going with our first new mechanic. There's going to be two phases of this game. Phase one is going to be uh, the exploration of the chase phases. Uh, we have our first item of the game, and this is going to be water. Uh, water is going to have unique properties. It is holy water. It is both a weapon and a key. So we're going to have specific uses during, um, you know, specific times. Uh, you'll see the first instance right now when you go over to this door. But uh, as I go right here, when I throw the water, it's going to break the sigil. Uh, this is the, the key part of it. My favorite game to run is probably Sonal 2. I actually did Sonal 2 recently at AGDQ, Awesome Games Done Quick. Uh, it got brought on uh, from backup, and it was actually the bonus game, one of the bonus games of the event. Uh, and it was quite fun. Uh, me doing every game ever was, I think, over 10 full days. Uh, last year, I decided to do every game I've ever ran. Uh, at the time, it was 167. And it took me over 10 full days. Uh, it was like 240 hours or something. Anyway, going back into the game here. We are now in, like, World War II. This game has time travel properties. We're going to be hopping around a lot, so don't worry too much about that. Uh, we're going to be getting a few things, though, here. We're going to be getting the introduction to a lot of the game's mechanics. Uh, number one is we're going to be having, uh, I think it's called Spiritual Healing. Uh, we're going to be introduced to a ghost. Uh, these ghosts are minor enemies. They're not, they're not real enemies. Like, if you're wondering what I mean by that, they don't tend to leave their major hubs, and their puzzles are very easily solvable. So, we're going to run into this phone booth. There's a ring. We're now going to hand the ring to the ghost, and you'll learn about spiritual healing. Oh, no. Also, a lot of the sound effects will be from classic Capcom games, since Capcom didn't make this. Uh, so, they sound familiar. That is probably why. Anyway, uh, the ghost is now dead, uh, but we're going to progress forward. Uh, throughout the game, there will be these fountains. Uh, we'll be using them every now and again. They are save points, but also they are water refill points. Uh, what I care about right now is actually the water refilling. I don't really care about the saves, because I'm not going to save in the middle of a speedrun. That's weird, right? <laughs> so, uh, we do want the water, though. Uh, I'm actually going to go right here. I'm going to throw it. It goes surprisingly far. That's going to tag the sigil, and it'll actually place you right in front of it. A lot of content that it is. Uh, also, not only did I do Sonal 2 during AGDQ, I also ran the original Clock Tower, uh, Clock Tower SNES or Super Famicom, um, which I think both those VODs are currently on the GDQ YouTube channel. I also ran a lot of different horror games in my tenure of uh, GDQ. So, I like the genre, what could I say? Uh, anyway, there's a ghost right here. We're actually just going to ignore this one. Uh, this is an optional ghost, you'll get an item if you save her, uh, but we're not going to do that. Instead, we're going to be going to the tailor. And there's a neat little trick you can do here, because like I said, water goes surprisingly far. The moment the camera swaps, you can actually throw the water. And I hit it from that far away through the wall. So you just... And it launched.
All right, now we're in the tailor. We're going to be making way through. Uh, going along, though, this game is also a PS2 game, so the only way you can play it is on a PS2, in case anyone's wondering. Uh, it's always nice to kind of talk about what console everything's on. PS2 here, so. It is a classic game. I'm now all out of waters. I've used everything I had to do, and there you go. Also, for mainline runs, I believe I've done about 10 between AGDQ, SGDQ, and GDQX events. Alrighty, so now we're going to begin the game officially. Now, what does that mean? Have you been playing the game? It's been like five minutes, hasn't it? Yes. However, we haven't really been playing with an opponent yet. Oh, well, sorry, I just dead stopped because my control, my hand slipped. There we go. Uh, we're going to be getting introduced to the game's core mechanic, which is, uh, like I said, the stalker mechanic. Uh, throughout the game, there's going to be pursuers, stalkers, uh, whatever you want to call them, and they're going to try killing our character here, Alyssa. Also, just to give you some lore of the story, uh, this is like a Sailor Moon horror game. That is the best way I can describe it, and you'll see what that means as we go. Uh, anyway, here's Sledgehammer. What, his name is just Sludgehammer. Why he carries a big Sludgehammer? It's a very simple thing. Am I lying? No, his name is actually Sludgehammer. Uh, first things first, we're going to talk to this uh, red cabinet. We get a key off this. And then we're going to squeeze right past him. Uh, he's going to go for a swing, and he's going to miss entirely. Uh, that's going to allow us to go into the room. To which, at this point, I will grab... Two things. One, we need the invitation. Uh, this is a key item that's going to allow us to get into the next little section that's going to allow us to kind of beat the section. And we're also going to be using this chair. This is like an emergency event. Uh, these exist in the game, and there are ways of removing a stalker for a temporary amount of time. Uh, so we just use this one right here. It gets us the room. It's kind of the tutorial one, and we can make our way over to the theater which is going to be the next major hub. As well, since this is a uh, a marathon-esque showing, uh, you know, a GU Hoffick showing, uh, I'm actually going to play a little bit safe, and we'll be grabbing this item right here, no, this item right here, which is Lavender Water. Uh, lavender Water is our way of healing. Uh, I don't need this entirely, but it's one of those things that you want to be very careful. It is much better to be safe than sorry, especially in a setting such as this. We will see the Scissor Man at one point. He's not going to be what you expect, though. Anyway, he got up from being hit with a chair. Um, one of the cool things about this game is that you can actually interact with puzzles while being chased. Uh, other stalker games don't let you do this, and it's actually one of the really charming bits of Clock Tower 3. So right now, I'm going to refill my water. I am back up to 3. And we'll be entering the theater. So, something I want to mention as well about this game, you're wondering. Oh, you mentioned healing. What's your health? The top left bar isn't the health you think it is. In the top left, there's a full bar. That's a panic meter. So you'll die in one hit if your panic is maxed. Uh, every time you have an attack done near you, you go up in panic. So you simultaneously have more health and less health than you think you would. Because on the one hand, if you get hit, it's not so bad. On the other hand, if you are near a hit, you also get hit. So it's kind of awkward with that. Anyway, he goes for a swing. I don't get any damage. It's very good for me. Uh, we're going to be going backstage. He does not follow me back here, luckily. And we're going to be grabbing a combination from the back here. Uh, Clock Tower 3 does have the unfortunate property where if you don't know, the, if your characters know the answer, you can't brute force it. Uh, the game does not allow you to do that. So we need to grab this note, and that's going to allow us to open up a safe in a moment here. Uh, right now, we will have a bit of RNG. I want Sludgehammer to not be in my path that I'm running. He might. Uh, let's see if he is. I have Lavender. That's actually a really good spot. If he doesn't attack, he attacked. Oh, boy. Uh, I think we'll be fine. Panic goes down the longer you're not being attacked. I think that's barely enough to get by. I think it was a minor attack. As long as I don't get attacked twice, I think I got this. Anyway, the answer is 103. Uh, this is going to allow us to get the uh, key that brings us to the second half of the theater. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad you all have been enjoying it so far. And as well, before we head on back, there is a lavender right here. Uh, this healing is normally the one you want to grab, but considering how, you know, 
How it can go. Better safe than sorry, right? So. Now is time for us to do a fun little manipulation. Uh, depending on where you're standing is going to be very important for enemies. Uh, because if you run in the middle, you'll get stunned. If you run on the left, uh, the, you know, the wall, uh, you'll manage to avoid the uh, slam entirely. Uh, that prevents any knockback, which is good. Uh, as well, doors will prevent him from attacking these, so I want to be very careful as I time these. And I'll actually be using this to my advantage. I'll be breaking the sigil. While that's breaking, I'm actually going to open this door. I'm going to wait right here. Uh, that's going to prevent him from attacking me. And then I can just go right here and open this one. And hey, look, he's not attacking me yet again. It's a neat little manipulation trick that allows us to get through a very tight window without taking any real damage. Which is, you know, pretty good for us, huh? Alright, up next is going to be one of the most awkward uh, hallways in the game, and this is something that's definitely a, uh, a new runner trap. Uh, if you are running this game and you're having problems in this hallway, I'm about to do you a huge favor. Uh, the reason why is because once you grab this, Sludgehammer's going to come back, uh, it's the matches, and he's going to try attacking you. Uh, if you try going past him immediately, you will get stuck and he'll put you into panic and you'll die. So what we're going to do is we're going to wait for him to start moving. Once he starts moving, I immediately throw and then I go. The reason why you have to do this is because if you throw immediately, he will actually block this entrance and you won't be able to call through. You will get stuck forever and he'll hit you the moment he uh, wakes up. So you need to put him with the holy water when he's a little bit away from that. So just the moment he starts moving, it's a little bit RNG. It does lose time if he takes too long, but it's one of those things that if you don't do it that way. It will not work. All right, and we are almost done with the theater. We have maybe uh, one more real section here. Um, it's kind of fun because you end up really taking some tight lines to avoid the enemies in very bold ways. Speaking of which, uh, we're gonna do a trick. Uh, I'm gonna be hugging this bench coming up. So I'm gonna run right here. Uh, by hugging the bench and walking against it, I prevent a knockback. It doesn't look like I did anything. Doing that wrong, you get knocked back and scared, and you likely go into panic. Right now, we also have RNG. Uh, I need to make sure he doesn't chase me. It looks like he is, but let's play it safe. If he doesn't chase you, you can get through here without throwing the water, but we have that last water just in case he does that. It is the safety water, after all. And I hope you like RNGs. Now that we've lit the matches, we can cross the balance beam. Uh, the balance beam is terrible. Uh, you can fall off this and die for one, and if you die, you go back to the beginning of the theater, which is bad. Uh, but the bad part is you'll see every now and again we are going to have that animation where she like goes, oh, oh, oh. Uh, I don't want that, and I have no way of controlling that. It's RNG. She just feels like doing it sometimes. If she does that, that's bad. Uh, ideally, if you want to go for really good times, you only want two total uh, from both there and back. However, um, I'm probably going to end up getting four. Four is the average. Usually two there, two back. Um, and then getting like two total is the, the god seed. Oh my god, like two in a row. That was almost really good. I might get five. We'll see. All right, no, no, I got four. I got the average. Okay, we have one more bold dodge to do, and then we'll be out of this section. Uh, we're introduced to a new enemy type, which is these moths. Uh, they're bad, they'll grab you. Um, that's it, there's moths. We're gonna run directly through him because he actually has a tighter window than you think. And we are almost out of the theater. We just have to get on out of here, and we're gonna be hitting the first boss in a moment here. So, for those of you watching currently, if you've never seen Clock Tower 3, I'm gonna implore you to think about this for a second. What do you think the boss fight is like? If you have seen it, please don't answer it, or, you know, maybe you'll have fun with it. But if you've never seen this game and you're thinking what a boss fight might look like, what do you think it looks like? Because I will assure you right now, you will never guess. Anyway, we're officially out of the theater. Uh, we're going to be going back to the tailor and then back to the theater, and then the boss fight shall begin. 
Uh, I'm actually be hugging the right side this time, just to bring us closer to the theater when we are uh, exiting. Uh, I want to make sure to also avoid the fountains. It's kind of weird because one of the big things about a lot of horror games, not just this one, is uh, tight movement. Being able to hold a good line and not uh, have too many suboptimal movements is very important. And good movement is rewarded heavily in really any horror game. And it's one of those things that stacks up over time. Dance off a puzzle, puzzle with timer, run, QTE, time based, a hamburger. Well, we'll have to see. We have some good guesses here. A lot of you think it's probably going to be a puzzle. You see, that's a smart idea. In a game like Haunting Ground, it actually does end up usually being puzzles. Uh, Clock Tower 3, uh, you'll see. Uh, anyway, first things first. Uh, in this room, I'm going to be grabbing this green arrow. Uh, this will be a special tool to help us later that's called the Repellent Arrow. Uh, and then we're also going to be grabbing uh, lore. So, lore of this game. Uh, every time we go back in time, we're going to be having a special ghost, and we're going to have to make spiritual healing them. Uh, in this case, you need to help a little girl who got beat up. Um, Sledgehammer decided to hit a little girl with a sledgehammer. She's like playing... It's goofy as hell. She's like playing the piano, and then Sledgehammer just comes in and smacks her. It's as comical as it sounds. Like, if, if you're wondering, oh, that must be... T that's awful. It's like, hilariously PS2. It is goofy as hell. And it is, um... It is laughably poor. Uh, anyway, we're gonna get her watching it back to her. This game's also just really goofy if you've never seen it. It has a lot of, uh, strange mocap. And it is worth a check. It turns into Tekken. Oh, it's just gonna go 2D fighting game. You know, you, you might be right. We'll see. Anyway, now that we have it, Sludgehammer is gone. Uh, he is going to be waiting for us at his boss arena. And uh, here's the answer. Uh, the boss fight is going to be a magical girl fight. One person in chat guessed it correctly. Uh, if you're wondering what that means, uh, you'll see. I mentioned it was a Sailor Moon horror game, and I'm not kidding. Uh, I won't play the transformation, because it's just kind of, it's not too much there. Uh, you get a bow and arrow. What's going to happen is our water is going to turn into a bow and arrow. And we're going to have to use that uh, to kill the boss. Anyway, here's Sludgehammer. Uh, as a minor thing, if you match triangle, it will skip his health generating. He has 26 victims, and he's sentenced to 486 years. That is his health bar. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to run up to him. Uh, I want to get slam. I'm going to fire one arrow immediately. Uh, got slam. One, two, three, four, five. So I'm going to hit him with a binding arrow. Getting a five charge will bind him. Uh, and I'm going to keep pelting with magic arrows. And the fun fact about magic arrows is that if you hit him with enough of them, you'll get something quite, uh, quite fun. Two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. And uh, channeling energy. We're going to hit with a spirit bomb. Yes, a genuine spirit bomb. Anyway, uh, Sledgehammer is going to be dead. Walk it off. That, that's, those are screams of joy. He definitely uh, isn't suffering. <laughs> uh, don't worry. He like he melts. Like, he turns into rocks and dies. But um, yeah, that's what. That's how you fight. Every boss fight is going to be that. Um, it is a combination of running away from stalkers until you build up enough magical energy, and then you use magical girl powers to quite literally send them to the shadow realm. So, um, unique quirks about the fight. Number one, uh, since we won the boss fight, I now have more water. Uh, we went from having uh, three waters, now I have four. Uh, that's going to be quite handy throughout the run. But also, more importantly, something you didn't notice about that fight. If it made it look easy, it is not. So, uh, I bet you're wondering, uh, oh, you know, it's a bow and arrow. That must be an easy fight, right? You may have noticed something if you're observant during that fight. I never aimed. Uh, Clock Tower 3 is a game that... 
doesn't know how to aim. So what that means is you can't aim the bow and arrow. Wherever you originally fire is where it will go. And it will normally try to target the boss. It auto-aims. Usually. It, there's a weird time later that it'll have some like weird aiming, but... Uh, you can't actually... Uh, once you pick a direction you're firing, you will only fire in that direction. Meaning, if you're not careful, it, some enemies are very hard to hit. I am not kidding. There is no way to actually aim. You have to understand, our main character here is like 15. She doesn't know, she doesn't understand the concept of aiming. That's, that's what happens. She has, uh, you know, uh, godly magical abilities, but she don't, she doesn't know how to aim. Uh, anyway, right now we're doing a lot of, uh, basic lore stuff. It's, hey, you go to Grandpa Dick's room, and then after that you, uh, go to another room with, uh, like, a puzzle, and then you're gonna go to another area. And right now it's kind of a lot of the, uh, oh, we have lore. Uh, I have a lot of consoles. I'm a big fan of, uh, physical media, Dark Row. Uh, so I have my PS2, I have, actually I have, like, a few PS2s. I have a PS3, I have a Wii, I have a Dream, I have pretty much every console except for an N64, and, um, right now the Xbox original because I don't have room for that. It's a fun time. Alright, so the puzzle there is just left, left, right, right, right. So one, two, one, two, three. Uh, and then this is gonna allow us to enter our next mechanic, which is portals. Um, you can activate portals by throwing two bits of holy water onto them. And then you're going to have um, really the next tub. Now we're in like I think like 1960s Britain or something like that. I don't remember the exact lore, but uh... I get a new PS5? Okay, this is gonna sound hilarious, and uh... This is gonna be very weird. Uh, for those of you who know me, and know uh, how I do streaming stuff, and how I do um, the world of content creation, I do a lot of horror games. I speedrun uh, over 180 uh, games, with most of them being horror. Uh, that being said, during Punchy's run of Silent Hill, I actually acquired a PS5. So yes, now I own a PS5. I never wanted to own a PS5 because I needed nothing for it, but they announced a new Silent Hill game that is exclusive to PS5. So I had to buy a PS5. What does that mean? It means I commit to the bit. In case you're wondering, how does a man just buy a PS5 off a whim? Um, my job is content creation, so it ends up working well that way. Anyway, if you're wondering, why is this man talking about a PS5 in the middle of the Clock Tower 3 run? Right now, it's just kind of puzzles. We're back to the actual game. Okay, so we have ghosts. Uh, we have a couple of ghosts in this house, and this ghost is going to have a few things going right now. Uh, this puzzle is really simple. You just make the flower face the painting. And we're going to make our way nice and through this uh, house. It's going to be kind of weird, too, because ultimately all we need here is a key. And that's going to bring us back to the other house. And then we're going to come back here afterward. So this is kind of a lot of, oh, just sort of do the basic puzzles to get where you're going. And also, I did have to. It is a, it is a, uh, a job thing. I'll be able to write it off in my taxes. It is actually a business expense, unironically. I never thought I'd have to expend, expense a PS5, but here we are. Alright, so now we are able to uh, get on out of here, and we'll be heading over to, uh, back to the house. My job is content? Yes, I am a full-time content creator. I uh, do things based around horror games, I run speedruns from the crypt, um, I've been doing it for four years actually. It is kind of trippy. Anyway, now we're done with that, you may have noticed I used all my water. Uh, during this cutscene you actually get a free refill. Uh, this water is going to be necessary for the game. Uh, it is a free grab, and we're also going to be able to get the key to the next thing right here.
and then we're heading back to the house. This is kind of why the uh, that's why I activated the portal right when I got here. It allows us to get in nice and easy. There we go. We're not prove to the IRS I mainly use it for my job. That's pretty easy to do when I have video proof of everything I'm using it for my job. Like, one of the upsides of streaming is I quite literally have video proof of this. I have video proof right now that I'm using a PS2, technically. Streaming is a weird area. Let's just put it that way without getting too deep into it. Anyway, going further along with how this goes. We are back in the house, and we're going to be needing some, uh... Some special tools here. Uh, one of which is going to be the key that activates the next stalker, and the next one is going to be another one of those green arrows. I haven't talked a lot about the green arrows just yet, however, you'll be seeing more and more of those. For anyone who does not know, by the way, if you're wondering what I'm talking about, maybe you're watching so far on YouTube, maybe you're watching right now and you don't really know a whole lot about who I am and what I do, um, I stream full time. So I do a lot of streaming hours of various horror games on, you know, um, a lot. Uh, usually it's over 40 hours a week. Uh, quite frequently it ends up being more. Um, a bit of a workaholic, in fact. And I tend to do a lot of different horror media. Like yesterday I was doing Sonal 2, uh, the day before that I was doing, uh, Resident Evil 3, and I was doing Resident Evil Village. Uh, I plan on doing every single Sonal Hill game later this week. And I was originally planning on doing every single Clock Tower game tomorrow, but my plans are going to be a little bit, uh, mucky now, or, uh, you know, mixed because of the new Silent Hill update. Anyway, uh, I want to mention right now, yes, speedruns from the Crypt is not, uh, do not get your accounting advice from speedruns from the Crypt or any GDU hotfics. Uh, please use an accountant. I'm not, I'm not an accountant, and more importantly, I'm not your accountant. Anyway, I got a green arrow there, I got camera film, and we're going to be, um, we're going to be going back to that house we were just at. We're going to be activating the next stalker by, uh, unlocking a door. Uh, also, um, if you want to see, I, I, I have a allotted amount of time for a cutscene here. I usually like to have one or two cutscenes to kind of give you flavor of the game. If you're kind of wondering what kind of game Clock Tower 3 is, I will show you. Also, yes, I do love, I do love my job. Um, more questions as well while we ha are heading this one. Uh, before streaming, I was a full-time IT worker. I fixed computers. Um, I decided streaming would be fun because I, you know, didn't have a whole lot of bills after paying off my student loans. And then, um, I've been with GDQ for about three and a half years, I think, now. I think I started at the end of 2020. And I've been running speedruns from the crypt and a Halloween special every year since. I do like Alien Isolation, yes. Also, no, do not commit tax fraud. GDQ does not recommend you commit tax fraud. That will go bad. You'll, what will happen is you will have to deal with the IRS, and no one wants to deal with the IRS. They're not, they are not kind, and they will not be kind. Anyway, now we can get back to the game. <laughs> you know, I'm talking, I, I realize I'm talking a lot more about taxes than I thought today's speedruns of the crypt would talk about. Anyway, what's gonna happen here is we're gonna be activating the next stalker. And this one has a lot of personality, so I figure, why not let, let's meet the guy, shall we? We're gonna have a really sweet cutscene. This game has sweet moments. You know, it has touching relationships and good character building. I came to tell you that dinner's ready. And I told you that you don't need to be worried about me. Your old mother may have dicky eyes, but she's not on her last legs yet. You just concentrate on your work. Anyway, what is it you're making this time? Some new toy that'll have the local kids a gog, I bet. Actually, I've been busy making this. See, look, he made her a blanket. Look how sweet that is. Isn't that just oh, the nicest thing? What's this? Winter's coming, and I don't want you catching cold. 
wandering around outside. I've been making this in my spare time. It's How's so it touching. Been? It's lovely. So warm and soft. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> You see, if you love your job, you never have to work a day in your life. That's what I aspire to do. This is the acid bath. Well, not the acid part, I I'd be as happy as him. VDQ does not advocate uh, boiling people in acid. D don't do it. He's still going, by the way. Alrighty. Anyway, here is Corroder. Uh, Corroder is the next stalker. We're gonna throw water on him immediately. Uh, he has ranged attacks. He's also a gamer, so if you cover him in water, he immediately combusts into flames. Uh, we're gonna sneak on past him, and now we have a lot to do. Corroder is going to be one of the meanest stalkers in the game, and he is fun to deal with. Anyway, now that we're back in business, uh, Corroder's thing is he chases you, but he also jump scares you more than any other, uh, you know, a stalker in the game. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to take some very specific movements to avoid these. Uh, number one is what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk on this corner. I'm going to throw the water that prevents a knockback and damage. I'm going to cover him in the water. He's going to be on fire once again. Uh, within the room, we're now going to be grabbing a hammer. And as you guessed, we're going to be getting another jump scare right in this room. Uh, what's going to happen is Corroder will actually enter. However, there's going to be a really weird thing with doors. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to wait right about here. And I'm going to sort of run through him. Um, he does not exist when the door is open, so you can run directly through him. Uh, this is going to be one of the hardest dodges in the game. Um, it usually works. Keyboard usually. Uh, what I want to do is I'm actually going to be hugging the wall just like this. Uh, that usually allows me to get the perfect line, and hey, there we go. So there's the range attack, he misses. Uh, getting hit with acid is actually good. Uh, getting hit with his butt is bad. Now, what, you, what do I mean by that? Corroder's goofy. He has two ranges of attack. Either one, he covers you in acid. Two, he does a genuine butt slam, where he jumps up into the air, and he tries to sit on you. And that is his actual attack. Anyway, uh, he's gonna jump scare us once again. Once he starts moving, I'll throw the water. Uh, we're gonna burn him right there so we can get past him. And I'll have one more water left. Uh, this last water is gonna be quite important. Uh, I did get RNG ghosted. That's not the end of the world. It's not gonna matter too much. It's a minor stop. And he'll stop chasing me right when I get here. I just realized something. I think I do. I'm hoping that was good. I forgot to uh, adjust my retro ting, I think. So don't don't mind me to turn black and white for a second. So this puzzle is easy. Just go the least convenient path each time. If you're wondering, oh, why not go for the closer planks? Uh, they break immediately. Okay, we're almost to the boss fight, and Corroder is going to be uh, one of the toughest bosses in the entire game. Alright, so I'm going to immediately turn around, I want to hug the wall, and the strat we're being right now is in the back here there's a green arrow, and I want this green arrow. Uh, right when I pick it up, I'm actually going to throw the water. Uh, that'll hit him with the... Holy water, allow me to pass him to get to the skate. 
then nice and easy, I'm going to be able to get to the fight. So, Corroder is a tough boss fight. The reason why, Corroder is one of the only enemies in the game who understands if they move out of the way, I can't aim. It's like he looked directly in the game manual. So, I'm going to be very careful with how I hit him, because Corroder has the tendency to dodge more than any other enemy in the game. Uh, he will jump left and right, and for someone who doesn't know how to move left or right, that's bad. Ideally, we're going to be using a series of counter hits, but the big thing is to bind him, I need a 6 charge now. I need a max charge. Before is 5, now I need 6. So, we're going to get some, some damage, hit him early. Get a little bit closer. I can stun him with 3, so I got to keep that in mind. I can always stun him with 3. Alright, I got a binding. Good. We're not in the best spot right now. I do want to hit him with that magical girl energy. Where is this fight when I'm trying to grind out PB attempts? Well, I think Corroder has more time because he beat up an old woman. Sludgehammer, I guess Sludgehammer beat up a little girl, but like, maybe on the scale of things, uh, he did beat up an old woman, everyone. So he doesn't quite die from that. I will have to hit him a little bit more, but we're in a good spot right now. We're just gonna keep hitting him with arrows. All right, good fight, he's dead. I thought I say he dodged. He dodged one of them, and I had to re-aim. He didn't dodge the spirit bomb. If he dodges left, I have to then, you know, adjust my aim. But it's usually firing an arrow and immediately going again. I was not kidding, no. A lot of what I'm saying has been quite uh, accurate. Like, if it sounds like I'm joking about this game, the joke is because it's really accurate what I'm saying. Which I guess is kind of funny, all things considered. That is true. Uh, it was an old blind woman. It wasn't just uh, an old woman. She she also uh, quite literally couldn't see it. In all fairness, though, I don't think there's. I don't think you can really. Uh, I, I think both are bad. I, I don't think there's either one that's exactly good. Uh, between which is worse, both are bad. Let's go with that one. We can, add, we can add in the next, GDQ does not advocate for blank, because uh, Clock Tower 3 has a lot of lessons you shouldn't do. Uh, do not hit children with sledgehammers. That is, uh, that is good life advice. Anyway, we are now teleported directly into the sewers. You don't have to worry about any hub worlds, we're just teleported directly here. Uh, this one, the action- wait, what? Oh, my controller's like unplugged. Uh, okay. Um. My PS2 is unplugged. Uh, oh boy. I hope I have a save. Huh. Well then. You always have one that's never happened before, right? Huh. Well then, that's bad. Why are you not working? That's never happened before? That is not. Uh, I don't know if I have a save. Huh. No, it is not. I didn't think my PS2 would unplug from uh, the, the, like the power cable. Huh, let me see something here. I have a single save 10 minutes in. 
That's bad. Well, we have probably about 40 minutes of run left, and oh boy, I didn't think I... You know, I thought about saving there as the funny part. Um, well, uh, what to do is the question. Let's go to break really quick. We're going to talk about what we're going to be doing really quick. All right, everyone. Apologies for the quick break there. Uh, well, it always happens. That's never happened before, right? Uh, if I'm wondering what happened, uh, when I was adjusting my PS2, apparently the actual power cable was really, uh, uh, I guess tight there, because the moment I moved it slightly forward, it unplugged entirely, which is, uh, bad. Um, and I, you know, I had to kind of hold the back to get the controller, uh, plugged in properly, because it's really awkward to, uh, plug it in and out. So, uh, yeah, it just sort of turned off, and I didn't have any saves, because, uh, normally I'm not expecting my console to shut down in the middle of it. So what we're going to be doing is, uh, during AGDQ, I ran Clock Tower, the original. Uh, we're going to stay on the Clock Tower vibe. Clock Tower 3 can happen in another date. I'll do a makeup run for that because I do apologize. Uh, normally, it does not happen where my console unplugs directly in front of me. Uh, so what we're doing instead is Clock Tower Ending A. Uh, this is the one that lost the bid war. I thought it'd be fun here. Uh, this category is about 20-ish minutes. Uh, after that as well, we'll be continuing with Fatal Frame as normal. Um, you know, if that was the last run of the night, that's one thing, but we do have another run there, and we don't want to interrupt the time too much, so that is what is going to be happening. Anyway, here is regular Clock Tower, ending A, and uh, hopefully it works out, okay? Hopefully my console doesn't magically shut off. Can you imagine this one does it? Hopefully not. Anyway, 3, 2, 1, let's go. So, Clock Tower. What is, this is the original Clock Tower. This is a, this is a different one. Uh, the idea behind this one is that this is a point-and-click horror game uh that came out back in 1995 it is the one of the og horror games and we're gonna be doing ending a this is the best canonical ending uh we're not going to be saving every friend uh and we're gonna be learning the truth in different ways uh that being said clock tower is a very rng game and right now i just lost a dice roll is this a rerun no this is not a rerun uh also, I think I might need to change the Twitch, uh, title. <laughs> but, uh, I'm, gl I'm glad we can always plan these out. That being said, in terms of dice rolls, if you are wondering, what did I just lose there? Well, you are supposed to get a key to go to some place called the West Wing. That allows me to get to the back half of the game. So, also, I have a PS2 slum. All right, so Bobby skip. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna click on the stairs and then we're gonna be able to pass directly through Bobby. Um, normally you would uh, wanna go to the door right after this, but since I don't have the West Wing key, I'm going to have to do a little bit more here. I do appreciate all of you being patient with things, by the way. Uh, uh, we're talking in the, uh, the break room, but yeah, I've never been Super Mario Sunshine before, I guess. I guess that happened like, what, at a shitty queue? So, it's definitely something to keep in mind that maybe I make... Oh, well, I don't know if I can even make more saves. There's a lot of memory card space. I'll have to figure out what to do in terms of a backup in the future there. I suppose the main thing is probably buy a new PS2 controller. Anyway, now that we're, uh, you know, ch uh, having Bobby chase us, uh, we currently need Bobby to get away so we can get the West Wing key. Uh, luckily, we can hide right next to the West Wing. All right, right next to where the key is, which is going to be in the, next to this room. Uh, we're going to be having something called the panic event. You don't see these all the time, but when the screen flashes, you need to mash the panic button a certain amount of times. Uh, if you don't, it's an immediate death. And then you can see Bobby uh, just leave. Uh, while we're here as well, uh, ending A is quite safe for the route uh, because we will be having to do a few things. Uh, considering we are not going to be having a, the record route, we can play a little bit safer now that we don't have Bobby anymore. Uh, first things first, uh, we are going to be grabbing this item right here. Uh, this is the pesticide. Uh, it's going to be used for a puzzle later, and we can break the game even earlier with Clock Tower right now. Uh, normally to break the game... Uh, you're gonna have to do a few things. Uh, first things first, we need to talk to this nest in order to actually get the key. And she's like, oh, there's a nest up there. If like, spot the nest. 
Also, I don't think it's an issue. Uh, I don't think that, uh, I've unplugged my PS2 a lot is the problem, so it's kind of awkward. When's all Silent and Hill run? I'm probably doing that over the weekend myself, if that's what you're referring to. All right, now we have the key to the West Wing, and we can now enter the West Wing. What we're going to be looking for is a few different things. I'm going to need a library, and I'm going to need the Crow Room. Uh, these are set rooms in the West Wing that are necessary to beat the game. Uh, as well... These rooms are going to be randomly spawned in. So the West Wing has five rooms. It's going to be the West. It's going to be the library, the pink bathroom, the crow room, the piano room, and an empty door. What we want to see right now is either the library or the crow room. Ideally, we want both. All right, well, we got a room here. Which room is this? Let's see. As well, we're starting on the top floor, so we have, hey, the crow room. This is a room we need. Uh, so I'm going to be doing a skip right now. This is called tech skip. Uh, by activating the text box along with doing this action, I can immediately skip any text in the game, meaning I don't have to wait for any actions. Also, realistically, for my PS2 problems, I don't need tech support for that. I just, you know, it's something to keep in mind. The crow is now free, and the crow will be helping us later. He's very important. Help the animals. Save the animals, right? Uh, right now, as well, in order to get into the end game, we're going to be getting a little boss fight kind of thing. This is another panic event, uh, but you need to fight a doll in order to get a key. Uh, this key is going to allow us to uh, get into the final room of the game. Uh, we might also have a neat trick coming up, depending on if I get the demon idol or the staff. Uh, it's actually exclusive to this category, ending A. This fight's also weird. It is a little bit RNG. I want it to happen immediately, which normally will happen if you just kind of run past. However, I did not get it. Uh, I got unlucky, so we're going to have to wait for the fight to start, which is not going well right now. Oh, there we go. Okay, we got the fight. So it's just bonked into the wall, and now we're out of there. Okay, so we are still going to be looking for a couple of rooms here. Uh, I still need to find either the piano room or I need to find the library. So finding the piano room is actually decent because, in theory, I will know immediately if I have Bobby or if I have the staff or the demon idol. Ideally, we want demon idol, but if we get staff, then, you know, I, I, I should just grab the staff. The reason why the doll room is good, or not the doll room, the piano room is good, is because if you don't have the staff, Bobby will jump scare you. And if you see a Bobby jump scare, that's really good. It's a fun game. I end up, uh, I really enjoy this game. It was the first game I ever learned how to speedrun. Also, this is the empty door I was talking about. And this is probably a room. Which room? This is probably going to be, you know, library. Piano. You know what? That's fine. Okay. And let's see what I got. I am pretty sure this is going to be Bobby. I feel like this is going to be Bobby. If it is, that's awesome. Hey, it was. Okay, it is Bobby. All right, that is great RNG. We have Bobby. He is chasing us once again, meaning I now have the demon idol, meaning I got good RNG. Kind of. I didn't get best RNG, but I got good RNG. So, I've never been so excited to see Bobby. Also, I'm going to play it a little bit safe here right now because Bobby does end up chasing us. Actually, let's see. Can I just sprint to the end? Again. So this is a trick called input buffering or lag reduction. Uh, by mashing the item menu, I can actually make Jennifer fly off the screen and she's going to be running much faster. As it reduces the total amount of lag in the game. Okay. Of course, that's pink bathroom. Uh, right now, we are looking for the library. That is going to be very important. Also, yes, this is where I get a lot of my scissor-esque uh, ideas. This is where the, uh, the scissors thing comes from. All right, so I get to show you a really cool trick that uh, I, you know, uh, is why I like ending A so much. 
Uh, we're going to take care of Bobby. He is going to go down right here. Another reason why the library is such a good room. Bobby is now gone. And I'm going to grab this note, and that's going to allow us to know about the Demon Idol. We're still going to have to get the Demon Idol, so, you know, that's a bit of a downside. Because uh, I had to essentially check every single room in the game. But now that we know we're on a Demon Idol game, that's going to save a good amount of time, because now I don't need to get the staff. In case you're wondering, world record for this category is held by me. It is like a, I think like a 1320 or something like that. Uh, it is a very difficult category because essentially any bad RNG and you would be resetting. It's a little rough. Uh, we're going to see a few tricks right now. Uh, this is hole skip. I'm using the text of the hole to actually bypass it uh, by doing that. Uh, I can run over it without having to get the plank of wood, and that saves a bit of time. There's also a skip here that I did not get it, but you're going to see it is there. Uh, it's kind of funny because you can see my item menu is still up, but I can't move it. Uh, there is a theoretical skip you can do here where if you can uh, get the movement on the different icons, uh, you can skip that cutscene, and that would save a lot of time. However, it has never been humanly done. So, food for thought. As well, uh, considering how difficult the trick is, I don't think it's worth going for, because the game's already in RNG hell. Alrighty, at this point, we now have the Demon Idol, and we can head to the end of the game. Uh, we still have a few things we gotta do, so while I'm heading to the end of the game, we're not going to the end of the game, we're going to the end of the game location. So... Clock Tower is weird. In order to beat the game and to get ending A, we need two parameters. Number one, you need to discover the truth about Mary, from Mary specifically. Number two, you need to discover the truth about Bobby. And there's a couple of ways of doing that, which either one, you have to read about him in the library, uh, sorry, the secret library, which that takes a long time to get there. We don't want to do that. Or you can learn from Lot, because uh, Lot... Uh, she, uh, if you find her body when she's still alive, she will tell you the secret of Bobby, and it's faster. So, what we're going to be doing is a special trick that's also very difficult. Um, I do apologize, because I have not... Uh, I've, I've practiced making this trick once when I was at GDQ, and I haven't really... Uh, if I mess it up, I do apologize. It's very difficult. So, this is the end of the game right here. Um, this is supposed to be a major puzzle. You need items to pass this dog or else it would kill you immediately. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use the text box right here uh, to bypass both the dog's death trigger and a little walking section afterward. Uh, what that's going to do for me is I'm going to then hold the text. Uh, we're going to have our dead friend right here. We're going to ignore her. I just learned the truth about Bobby. Uh, there's a lot. She's dying on the ground. Uh, but now I know the truth. I know what's going on. However, what I need to do is you can see right here that it says, oh, uh, there's a dog here. I can't, the perfume off, I can't do it. So what I'm gonna do is call the reverse dog skip. Uh, I, oh, I missed it, that's fine. This is definitely a hard skip, so give me one moment here. Got it. So, uh, what I ended up doing there was not only did I skip the uh, the roadblock telling you you can't go back, I also skipped the dog's death trigger. Now, the thing is, it's much harder to do it on the reverse because the game is not expecting you to be able to do that at all. So, uh, I am now back in the actual early game. Normally, once you enter that area, you're locked out. You can't go back. But I have now been able to go back. So, what does this do? Well, now I've discovered the truth about Bobby through Lot, meaning I don't need to go to the secret library. I've skipped the uh, the need to do that. The secret library is rough because in order to get there, you would need to um, you would need to use the pesticide. So you know the pesticide grab. You need to do that. You would need to go to the gold room. You would have to get a key from the gold room. Go to the silver room. And then, you know, find the staff in there. Like, find, like, the idea to use, or find the book in there. Um, which, I, if that doesn't sound like it's a lot of time, Jennifer climbs uh, stairs really slowly. In addition, normally whenever you're in the gold room, there's a Mary cutscene, and it's long. So, we don't want to do that. 
Uh, however, we get something really funny as a result of me breaking the game. So first things first, since we're on ending A, I'm going to be uh, grabbing the ham. Uh, it is in this fridge. It's not ham. And I'm going to be talking to this medicine cabinet. So this is a 50-50 chance. It is RNG. But if you talk to it twice, Jennifer will drink the chemicals on this uh, stand. The chemicals are either medicine or poison. We actually want poison. I got medicine. Medicine is bad. But that's okay, because I earlier grabbed the pesticide, because I kind of expected this. Wait, did I? Oh, let's check it again. Did she actually do it? She did. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's it's medicine. I was like, wait. You know, you know it's medicine because the uh the portrait will turn blue. Oh my neck, that's a crack. The portrait doesn't really mean anything, it's supposed to be like a status effect thing, but it's pretty meaningless. Anyway, luckily for us, we can just get the medicine right here. Are we can get the key right here? Uh it's a hidden item, so it's not gonna show up in my inventory, which that's fine. Um, but we're gonna have to get thrown in the shed manually. Uh, yeah, best RNG is that you just drink the chemicals and then you pass out, which is sad. <laughs> Don't GDQ does not advocating drinking random chemicals on your shelf. There we go. I did. I get to continue that from Clock Tower Three. Okay, so now Mary should be in here. There we go. Um, Mary is going to be entirely responsible, and she's gonna give uh, alcohol to us, which is. Don't don't accept alcohol from strangers like this. But uh, Jennifer's kind of stupid, so she's just gonna drink it. It's like, hey, here's a glass of wine to calm your nerves, and then you get thrown in the shed. But she poisoned that fast. Now I think about that, I don't realize how quickly she poisons that. Oh, she just had poison in the cup already. It's like a poison cup. I like, she just slams the whole thing and passes out. She's just like me for real, for real. Okay, anyway, now we're in the shed. Uh, we've now discovered the truth that Mary is evil. Uh, that is what ending A wants to do. Um, this man right here will commit cannibalism if you do not feed him. So that is why we grab the ham. Uh, as well, I'm actually going to uh, use some dialogue by talking to him, and then we just have to wait in the cage. Now we're locked in here forever. If only someone can help us. Who could possibly help us? Too bad Lot died, right? I remember her. She could have helped us. Hey, wait a minute. Hey, look, there she is. She's back. She came back from the dead. Oh my gosh, she's alive. Wait, she was just faking it. She didn't actually die. She was just lying in pain. So, it's funny because even though we killed Lot, Lot comes back from the dead, and I'm sure Lot's going to live a great long life. Oh no, she died again immediately. Oh, oh well, rest in peace ag again. She's dead. Or should I say double dead? So, we end up killing Lot twice, and now we discover the truth about Mary. Which I love the ending. The whole reason I like ending A is because you quite literally get to bring her back from the dead. And I always think that's just really funny. It's like, oh, she's supposed to be dead at this point in the game. And uh, since we broke the game, we now know the truth about Bobby before we're supposed to. Meaning I can just kill Lot there. Even though Lot already died. <laughs> and with all of that, we are now ready to actually go into the end game. Uh, luckily, ending A is weird, and an upside of this category is even though it is more RNG, it's actually uh, the safer of the two in terms of marathon categories. Uh, the reason why is because even if I get worst RNG, I'm still required to go, um, you know, get things like pesticide. So even if I don't get the Westman key in the very beginning, I have to go to that room anyway because I'm going to be going back to that area later in the game as a result of a lot of the um, late game puzzles. Uh, funny enough, the dog skip is still going to have to be done again. Uh, the dog does not recognize me, and uh, if you use the robe and perfume, you wouldn't be able to actually uh, do it again. So, once again, we'll be doing dog skip uh, for the third time, uh, this time once forward, and we're going to be going right to the final boss. Well, final bosses, I should say. Uh, 
Uh, in order to get there, I'm going to be doing more of the uh, input buffering that's going to make us faster while we're running through the caves. And here we go. Uh, here is a cradle under the stars, also known as, I suppose, the final boss of this game. It's a giant baby. Look at this man. He's on the YouTube thumbnail. I saw that. My God. Okay, so. Uh, the final boss is a panic event right here. Is at the match like 80 or something times. It's pretty easy. Normally, the true final boss is the dog skip because it's an actual, like, skip thing. So, you have to be a little bit careful. This is doable to be missed. We should have it. You'll know if she climbs all the way. Uh, I've talked about it before, but that baby is covered in orphan meat. He's like piloting a mech. And it's also flammable, so we covered in kerosene and whoop, he's dead. Alrighty, and here we go. We're right at the end of the game. Uh, time officially comes when we push the, uh, the third floor in the elevator, because uh, that is the last action. Uh, however, we'll also be watching the uh, the final cutscene because it is going to be like right there. Anyway, time's coming up in a moment. If we get everything right, we'll enter the elevator and we should make our way to the top. And time. We'll watch the final cutscene, make sure we did everything all right, but at this point, there are no more actions left to do, and we are good to go. Hope you all enjoyed Clock Tower here. Uh, I do apologize once again that uh, Clock Tower 3 did have issues. Uh, we'll probably find another day, uh, day to either run back to the game with either me or Demonic. Honestly, I will probably have uh, both in that sense to some degree. And I do hope they enjoyed both of the runs. Uh, that being said, I do a lot of both games on my own uh, channel, uh, twitch.tv slash Dices. Uh, also YouTube, I upload a lot of these, uh, these games. Um, so if you like horror games in general, it's definitely a place to check out. I also do a lot of um, speedruns from the clip. Uh, I talk about a lot of how the show runs, uh, how I do that, uh, over on my own stuff as well. So if there are any questions, you can ask me there. Uh, that being said, we're going to watch the ending here. Bobby dies because the clock tower is back in action. And we get a reward, which I bet you're wondering. Oh, wait. You know, what, what are you going to get at the top of the clock tower? It's... Oh my god, it's Laura! Look, she's alive! She made it! What a happy ending. See? Things end up okay. I'm sure nothing bad will happen. Surely. Yeet! Alright, she just gets thrown off the top of the clock tower. Just, just cast aside. And yeah, the plot of this game is kind of wild. But luckily, uh, ending A, we also save the birds, and they're going to come out from the left, and... We have GG. Jennifer lives, and then we can get our moment at the top of the clock tower. Uh, once again, I do hope they enjoyed not only this run, but uh, the previous run uh, and clock tower 3. Uh, definitely a little bit scuffed there. And we'll have more in a moment, but uh, let's just watch uh, get our, you know, true ending at the top of the clock tower, and then we should be good to go, I think. Definitely while my PS2 directly unplugged, huh? Can't say I've ever had that happen during, uh... Maybe it's time for me to buy a new PS2 controller. What can I... Maybe I have to go to, like, a retro game shop and buy one? I don't want to buy, like, a weird thing. I want to buy, like, a legit one. But it's probably a good idea. Anyway, there's the top of the clock tower. The rain is over. We are free. You get to see a clock tower. So, 
I hope you enjoyed this game and Clock Tower 3, and uh, thank you for watching that part. Up next will be Fredo Fatal Frame, and I hope you enjoyed it. I'll be right back. All right, everyone, welcome back from the break. Hope you all enjoyed the uh, the last last runs that we had. Uh, definitely uh, interesting uh, fix there, but we are back on track and back to normal. I uh, hope you're enjoying this episode of Speedrunners the Group so far. We do have one more game for you tonight. Uh, we have a classic horror IP that you do not get to see nearly as often as a lot of the other ones, such as Resident Evil and Silent Hill, but is still just as good. Up next, we're going to be having Fatal Frame 1, any percent with maxi lobes. Take it away. Yep. What's up, I'm GDQ? Hi, chat. Um, yeah, I'm Maxi. I speedrun a lot of games, uh, but this one's definitely uh, a throwback for me. I grinded this a lot back in 2018, 2019, with one of my friendliest and best rivalries in speedrunning so far for me. It was. Uh, running against Alien and just grinding down Fatal Frame. A uh, bit rusty at it, but I'm going to explain pretty much everything that goes into this run. Uh, and like X said, not a whole lot of Fatal Frame runners, but definitely a nice niche community. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of very, very uh, talented runners, not just of the Fatal Frame series, in the Fatal Frame community, but of other games as well. So. Uh, but we are going to start time in. I wonder how long it's three. Wait, <laughs> three, two, one, and go. There we go. Okay. So, Fatal Frame uh, is a very um, fantastic series. Very well done games, um, revolving around exercising ghosts with cameras which is uh i mean that's pretty cool the camera obscura specifically and uh the gameplay is not like the other horror games that were around this came out in 2001 and it was definitely doing something extremely unique uh, because the combat which you're going to see in just a moment revolves around taking pictures of these ghosts that you are exercising with your camera. So we're gonna be gonna play as Mafuyu for the first little bit of the of the game. This is kind of like the tutorial. And right off the bat we fight a ghost with the camera. And I have already done a bit of speed tech. So to explain that speed tech while we get out of here with Mafuyu um, the camera, when you take a photo of a ghost, there is a cooldown. You can't take another photo immediately. There is a little, you know, waiting period before you can take another photo. But there is a way to manipulate the game into letting you take another picture immediately, and it has to do with the ghost's animations. If there is a ghost in a, uh in just a normal, like, standby animation, whether they are floating uh, towards you or if they're moving backwards or sideways, just if they're in a just regular movement or standstill animation, you can take a picture of them. And then you can move towards them to bait them into an attack animation. And when they switch animations, that is when the camera will allow you to take another photo immediately, it is that animation swap that allows that to happen, and we just simply call it quick shooting. Very uh, simple name for the mechanic, um, but you're going to see me do that as much as possible. There are some fights where it is not needed, um, and there are also a lot of fights that are, you know, are not necessarily consistent when it comes to quick shotting, because... Um, this game is very random. Ghosts, every single ghost fight is random. Um, so what they decide to do is not always up to you trying to move into them to bait out an attack animation or moving backwards to bait out a idle animation from an attack animation. Because that's how you kind of string things together in this game. Um, so yeah. You're going to see a lot of, uh, a lot of RNG here. Avoid the little blue thingy. 
works and that pops up and shows you Takamine's assistant. So, okay, little little kind of uh, information about what this game is really about is uh, Miku's brother, who you just saw us play as in the beginning, Mafuyu, he went to this mansion in the middle of the you know forest in Japan to try and find a famous novelist, uh, Jinsei Takamine. And he reportedly went missing while investigating this mansion. So Mafuyu, as the bright young lad he is, decides, I'll do that too. I will also go and disappear looking for my favorite novelist, Jinsei Takamine. <laughs> you know, kids these days. Um, so, Miku was like, hmm, my brother's been gone for a while looking for this guy. Think I'll go look for him. <laughs> you see a pattern here. Um, so that is essentially, like, the, the reason why we're here. That's why Miku's here. He's, she's looking for her brother who went missing looking for a writer. Uh, and you also just saw me do the first ghost fight as Miku, and you saw me get something called a uh, zero shot, or a fatal frame. Um, so when the camera, like, circle thing shows up uh, orange, yeah, that is that is how you know you're getting it. But sometimes the timing is a little tight. If you're too late, uh, that orange circle is just going to turn back to blue and you're not going to get as much damage. That's really what happens, is you, could, you just get more damage out of those uh, zero shots and fatal frames. And sometimes, that isn't always what you want. Also, scary... scary jump scare. But I'll explain more about that uh, as we get to some of the more complicated fights that involve trying to get zero shots and not trying to get zero shots at the same time. So we're going to find Takamine's editor. And we're going to fight him for the finals. Where is he? He's hiding. He's shy. It's GDQ. He's like, oh my god, no. I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready. Ropes. What is he doing? Come here. Okay. <laughs> what a lad. Did this inspire Luigi's Mansion? Absolutely not. But you know what? This is basically Luigi's Mansion for adults. Poke spooky Pokemon Snap. There's many jokes. There's many jokes about this, but... Um, for any of you who are like, is this really based on a true story? No. <laughs> no, it's not. The North American release of this game has that on there because, like, you know, I guess Tecmo were worried that maybe it wouldn't sell enough in uh, in North America. So they were like, hey, it's based on a true story. You know you want to play it. <laughs> you know you want to play this. It's spooky and it's based on true story. You know, so... Because, you know, unlike Resident Evil and Silent Hill, this game is, you know... Okay, so the similarities is that Silent Hill and Resident Evil being, like, the big two, they are made by Japanese teams, Japanese devs and writers and whatnot. Um, and there's... Uh, you know, there's, there's that similarity between that and Fatal Frame, but Silent Hill and Resident Evil are games that revolve around, like, you know, the western part of the world. They, they both take place in western countries and have a lot of that th those kind of themes to it. Um, whereas this game takes place in Japan, and there's a lot of Japanese folklore stuff going on. So maybe that's why Tecmo are like, oh, if we say it's based on a true story, then North Americans will be like, oh, I love Blair Witch. You know, so... Um... But yeah, that was Marilyn Manson that we just uh, captured inside of our camera. Uh, uh, we did a little quick shot maneuver there. It was, went pretty well, and then we finished him off with a zero shot to do all the rest of the damage. Uh, very straightforward fight. Nothing a whole, you know, no, nothing's super crazy yet. 
in the run. Uh, and you also probably saw me go into my menu earlier to change my camera film and also upgrade my camera to an extra little speed dot, because uh, that is something that you do in this game. There is four different types of film. There's 14, 37, 70, and... Zero? I believe? Uh, and you can probably guess that it, it goes up in damage from, from there, you know, it's like... 14, standard. Um, 37, which we're going to use a lot of because it's abundant and easy to pick up. Uh, that's the next level of damage, and that's what we're going to be using the most. Uh, type 90 we'll be using a little bit, but not a whole lot. Uh, we don't get a whole lot of 90 film on the route. Especially since a lot of the 90 film that spawns later on will be out of the way. Uh, and then the Type 0 will sp specifically only be used at the end. Um, and then upgrading the camera is very important. We're going to be upgrading uh, speed, obviously, because we want to do these ghost fights as quickly as possible. So we're going to be upgrading speed a lot at the at the start here, but um, there is also range and max value, which is essentially the, the camera will continue to build up power. Uh, right now, we're at one max value, so we can't do a whole lot of damage when we fill up the camera. Like, the longer you look at a ghost with the camera, the more damage builds up. But um, we're not gonna really we're not gonna be t be able to take advantage of that fully, uh, which you don't really need to in the run. So it kind of works out. Also, you see here that I'm taking pictures of kind of these, whether they're like doors or j just like areas where it's glowing blue. That'll direct you towards a hint, and that hint is supposed to... you're supposed to take a picture of it, and after you've taken a picture of it, it'll show you where you need to go next. Uh, and going there, you'll you'll either pick up an item, or like take a picture of something else, and it will uncover uh, the thing that you took a picture of in the first place. So that those two doors are both locked. We can't go through them until we take pictures of them, get the hint, and then go do the thing in the hint. That is a very... That's a common thing in Fatal Frame, you know, in the series as a whole. It's a reoccurring kind of puzzle solution thing. Woman pulled in. So you see the, the like the scroll goes away and then you... That means that you unlocked the door from earlier. And yes, Miku is, uh, she's, she's going fast. She's, she's doing her best. You, in Fatal Frame games, you really do not run. You kind of just, like, lightly jog. And trust me, it gets slower and slower as the series goes on. <laughs> like, past Fatal Frame 3, oh boy. You're, you're power walking in some of those games. It says run when you go to the controller scheme. It's like, press this button to run. And it's like, nah, you're walking. That ain't running. Alright, so here's this scary little girl who's going to be floating towards us. Not even floating, she's on the ground. But, but as you can see, I'm manipulating her animations in order to get quick shots. So I took a, I took a picture of her. I slowly walked into her to bait out a, an attack animation, which then allows me to take another picture, and then I walked backwards as far as I could to bait out the idle animation. So she comes out of the attack animation, and that gives me another quick shot opportunity. And like I said before, you're going to be seeing that a lot. And then here is the only important despawn in the run. Um, this is the broken back lady. Broken neck? Broken back? Everything's broken. She's not having a good time. She fell off stuff. And, and is in <laughs> in pain. Um, but she spawns, and usually you would fight her, but you can actually just despawn her and then leave. That is the only time you're really allowed to do that. So we take advantage of it.
So uh, that was Mr. Takamine, and we took his journal and uh, took a bit of a hint, and now we're going to go pick up a... Um, God, I forgot what these things are called. If anyone knows in chat, I'm going to pick it up. This thing. It's a puzzle piece. I don't know what the proper word for it is, but it's a puzzle piece. And we're going to be using that on a door. Now, uh, I did say I was a bit rusty, and um, the funny thing about Fatal Frame is that these doors and these puzzles, um, when, you're, when you speedrun these games, you don't actually know the solutions anymore. You just tend to for actually forget them. Uh, and instead, you just let muscle memory take over. You, you just don't think. You just do. You just press button on controller and it work. But in this case, I might have to press buttons a few more times <laughs> because I might actually not fully remember. And that's okay because it won't take long. Now, if I could read Japanese, that would change everything, but I can't. Okay, she's doing an attack right off the bat, which is very strange. And she's teleporting. Behind me? Sure, okay. That works. That was odd behavior from her. She usually doesn't attack right off the bat. But we got her. So that is another one of us, uh, a Takamine's assistants. We are going to be fighting her uh, once in that room, and then we're going to be fighting her again right out here. There's Mr. Takamine. There, there's the boy. Now, at this point, we're going to upgrade speed to three. And we're going to see if she wants to play nice. We're going to wait a little bit. She teleported. Okay. Okay. Strange behavior. Is she charging? She is charging. That's fine. So having her teleport like that is not good. As I said earlier, the ghosts in this game are very random, so all, all of these fights are going to either just look you know, really, really flashy and cool, or they're going to look like they take forever. Because <laughs> that's just kind of how Fatal Frame is. Now we're going towards Mr. Takamine, finally. And unlike the assistance of Takamine's, we won't be fighting him twice, we will be fighting him once. Ah, flying spider monkey thing. Uh, that's that's also random. Sometimes that thing doesn't spawn and you save two seconds. <laughs> it's, <laughs> this game's silly. I don't know why that flying spider monkey thing even exists, really. Oh god, camera angle, please. Oh, I also forgot to mention that. This game is not tank controls. This game is directional inputs. Uh, and if you've ever played a game with directional inputs with fixed cameras, you know that it is a bit of a struggle sometimes. So movement in this game is not easy. Okay, we're gonna look up at Mr. Takamine. He's T-posing to assert dominance. Skip, uh, skip some cutscenes and let's see where he spawns. He spawned behind me. That's really good. That is solid. We're going to be able to just hang back, take pictures of him. The farther away you are from talk, uh, Mr. Takamine, the better, because he just kind of chills. 
once you get close to him, he starts moving around like very, very quickly, and it makes taking pictures very annoying. I believe the current world record strategy for this guy actually involves keeping him in in the house, uh, which I do not do because it is extremely risky. So we're just gonna play it safe. That was a really good fight. I I had about 10 damage off from getting him with the zero shot, and that's okay. That's all right. Still solid, played it safe. And uh, night night one is done. Night night one is like an introduction, really. It it explains kind of like how the puzzles work, all of the um, not all of the items that you get, but like a few items that you get. You know, it, it really it's a good start. If you finish night one, by the time you finish night one in Fatal Frame, like you know you're in it for the long run. If you can get past night one in this game, you're probably hooked in terms of a casual playthrough or just enjoying the game. So now we're on night two. We're going to start by looking at her hands. <laughs> My hands! Where's the, where's the sanitizer? All right, so here's the introduction of the lady with no eyes. If you couldn't tell, she's a lady and she doesn't have eyes. So uh, she has to rely on hearing, which means that if you run around with her, in it, you, you just you get caught. So you got to be really careful with her. And then here's Marilyn Manson again. Uh, we're going to take a picture real quick, and we're going to walk towards him, get that quick shot opportunity, and then finish him off with a zero shot. Good damage. That was, that was perfect. <laughs> cool. So yeah, you can see very effective. If you've played this game before, you probably see that fight and you're like, whoa. Like these quick shots are like actually very powerful. They are. They are very powerful. And they they only get more powerful too. You're gonna see me uh hopefully absolutely decimate certain ghosts. Uh even ones that have an enormous amount of health and kind of act like mini bosses almost in this game. Because there really are no like you know, spoiler alert, there really are no like boss fights, so to say. There's only really one boss fight at the very end of the game, so I'll just call them mini bosses. Kind of, I'll point out when when those happen. Takamine was technically a boss, so uh, I'm gonna check if I can get speed four. We got speed four. Awesome. Usually, right after Marilyn Manson is done and dusted, we can get speed four if you've gotten a few zero shots. Because I forgot to mention, those points that accumulate, zero shots give you more points. This is two, six, one, one, I think. Nice. I remembered correctly. Which ending are we going for? So any percent just gets the standard regular ending um, because this is a just brand new, like, new game file. Uh, also, the Xbox version has an extra ending. The Xbox versions of Fatal Frame 1 and 2 have some extra content that we do not get on the PlayStation 2 version. So if you actually want to play, like, the definitive versions of Fatal Frame 1 and 2, then the Xbox versions are the ones for you. Oh, we got the quick sh Oh, we got the quick shot. Nice. Uh, this child in the well rarely ever gives you the quick shot, and we got one, so that's that's pretty tight. Uh, also, I name her Childy because I I mistyped child in my splits one time, and I just ran with it. So that's Childy. And 
right now she's exercised. She's in my camera now. <laughs> um, but yeah, if you ever feel like playing Fatal Frame, they're all available on the PSN store for PS3. You know, if you just hook your PS3 up to the internet, you can download those. Um, which I definitely suggest, but they are not the Xbox versions. So if you really, really love this, these games and you don't have the Xbox versions, then it you, you might want to get them. They're not... I shouldn't say they're not terribly expensive because the retro gaming market right now is um, kind of a joke, but they're probably not as bad as the PS2 versions. I will tell you that right now. The PS2 versions are the ones that are astronomically high. All right, we got good RNG here. She's going to fly right by me instead of attack me at the door, which is fantastic. Again, this is the no eyes lady. She only responds to running, and right now I'm running, so she's trying to attack me. <laughs> but running is faster, or, well, light jogging, rather, is faster. So, getting the, uh, getting the good RNG there is awesome. Unfortunately, these games are not available on Steam. Only Fatal Frame 4 and 5 are available. Only 4 and 5 have gotten ports. Fatal Frame 1, 2, and 3 do not have ports. Um, I have no idea if Tecmo are planning on doing some type of remaster collection. I don't even know if Tecmo have the source code for these games anymore. I gotta be honest, that is sometimes something that happens. Uh, is just not hanging on source code. But, um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see if that ever happens, because that would be great. It would it would finish off the series. And, like, the only game that really doesn't need to be ported is the Fatal Frame 2 Wii Make, as in it's on the Nintendo Wii. Uh, it's... I'm not gonna say it's bad, but it's just not necessary. You don't need to play that. It's all good. You can You can skip that if you want. You can also skip the spin-off game called uh, Spirit Camera, which is available on the Nintendo DS. The only person I know that's even played that game is um, Starwind. So. And apparently it sucks. Which I, I'm not surprised. It's a spin-off for the Nintendo DS. Oh. Is this incorrect? Wait, what? X left? X left, okay. The way that I complete these puzzles, if I if I actually don't do it correctly, so there's only three ways you can do this. You can either do X left, X right, or right X, or left X. There's four. Math. Um, that is the whole muscle memory thing I was talking about. Uh, I should have wrote these down in, like, notes, but I didn't. For you see, I am a smart lad. Okay, X right. No. There we go. Okay. No, the PS3 store is not closed. It is not closed yet. So, if you have any game, if you have a PS3 hooked up to the internet and you can buy games on the PSN store, I would suggest trying to buy some of your favorites that maybe you don't have access to or you don't know if you're actually going to be able to acquire a physical copy one day because that store will eventually probably leave. It'll it'll go. Sony will just shut it down eventually. And Fatal Frame 1, 2, and 3 are all up there. And they're all good. They're just... Yeah, they all work. <laughs> yep. I like that reference. I am so smart. I am so smart. S-M-R-T. What is that? Simpsons Road Rage? Alright, so this is the first time we actually take on the uh, blind lady. Oh, she's not blind, she doesn't have eyes. It's a bit of a difference. Bit of a difference there. Um... The lady with no eyes. So she actually did something we don't want to see, but that's okay. Because I'm just going to take her out anyways. This is the first time you actually fight her. Um, that wasn't a really good example of the best way of fighting her. I'll show you a really good example in, like, a little bit. You'll see exactly how that fight's supposed to go. Man. 
<laughs> Mega Man Legends. Yeah, that is on the store. I've never played Mega Man Legends. Yeah, there's a lot of great there's a lot of great games that are still available on the PS3 store. And funny enough, like I said earlier, the retro gaming market is so messed up that you could probably purchase a PS3. You could probably purchase a used PS3, hook it up to the internet, and buy all of these games on the PSN store, and it would be cheaper than buying them as PS2 games. Because as much as maybe one likes physical media, which I do, certainly, um, it doesn't mean that one has the fuck the funds, you know? You don't have the funds all the time. That's... that's just the truth. Like, if you don't want to pay $200 for this random obscure PS2 game, then buy a PS3 for like 50 bucks and hook it up to the internet and buy it for $10 instead. Makes, it makes sense, right? Oh, oops. Wait, reset this. Cool. Okay, so, again, she reacts to sound, so this is why we are going to mash the run button. It's going to allow us to move a bit faster than walking, and she's not going to know we're here, because you have to hold the run button for, like, a little bit of time before she actually responds to the, you know, the sound of you running. So we're just kind of, kind of, stutter step, is what we call it. It's the stutter step technique. It looks really silly. It looks very silly. Uh, and then we have this child again. We're going to exercise with a camera! Why did she do that? Oh my god, I can't wait! I can't wait! What do you mean, wait? Okay. So, remember what I said this game is extremely random with ghost fights? This is what I meant. <laughs> Sometimes things just happen. Things just happen. Okay, cool. That's done. We're going to put the demon's uh, tag scroll onto the wall. We're going to go through it. This is going to act as the shortcut between the, the two areas. Uh, and you've probably seen this, like, child ghost running around uh, who, who is indeed playing the game of demon tag with the fellow kiddos. Um... That is the child that we need to find. They are important. We must exercise the, ch the child. Uh, and... He so happens to be one of the most random ghosts in the, in the entire run. So I will let you know what kind of pattern we get. There's like five different outcomes five or six, I think, actually, of this fight. I will let you know if we get a good one or a bad one. Okay. We got an okay one. Now, the reason why this is just okay uh, is because we got, we got the weird pattern where he takes a few seconds to even spawn. He just doesn't spawn right away. He waits. Uh, so we got an okay pattern. We could have finished him off while he was running towards us, but um, there was too much stuff blocking my back. I couldn't back up anymore into the staircase, so didn't have enough time to charge up my camera enough. So that was just very mediocre. That was a very mediocre ghost child fight. But it could be so much worse. There's um, there's a few patterns that are much worse than what you just saw. Uh, very much so a run killer. Back when I was grinding world records, like that was a very big run killer because you can actually lose uh, up to thirty seconds just on that one kid, just 
being a brat. Huh? How'd that not work? Oh, now you'll work. Okay. Vengeance. He is vengeance. He is the knight. He is random face and ceiling. A little bit of downtime now, which is nice. We're just vibing. Oh. Picking up some more film. And, uh... Remember how I said I'll show you a way better example of the fight against the, uh... Lady with no eyes? Well, here it is. Here is the better example of the fight with Lady with No Eyes. So we're going to take a photo at max value twice. There it is. Max value twice. Take another. T the third photo is kind of important to react to because she will do two things. She'll either act like she's attacking, and she just won't, which just happened, which is kind of rare. Uh, or she will actually attack, and you need to wait a little bit before you take a picture, because you don't want to zero-shot her. The problem with zero-shotting is that you cannot get a quick shot off of a zero-shot. The zero-shot will cause a very long animation of the ghost, like, staggering backwards. Um, and you can't get a quick shot, so you need to wait the whole time. Uh, you don't have to wait too long, but it is the tiniest bit of time loss. And when you're going for, like, a really top time in this game, which, by the way, is very difficult, um, yeah, you kind of need those things to work out in your favor. Are you, uh, are you all talking about the singer with the, uh, with the epic band and they, uh, show up on the OSTs for these games? Oh. I think uh, the whole project is under her name, right? The band itself doesn't have a name. Shoutouts to the Fatal Frame 2 credits for having, like, one of the craziest banger credit songs of horror game history. They didn't have to go that hard. They didn't, but they did. <laughs> they just went in. I follow her on Twitter and she posts pictures of her cat. I mean... That's the exact type of person I would like to follow on Twitter. I am, I am definitely an enjoyer of kitty cats. I'm a cat person. I love dogs, don't get me wrong, but I'm definitely a cat person. Yes, uh, this game's this game is definitely the least sad. It's a little bit more cheesy than it is sad, but then, yeah, the Fatal Frame series gets very, um, very intense, for sure. All right, we're coming up to a uh, a ghost named Yai. She's a bit dangerous, I will admit. This is not a uh, this is not a easy fight. Um, nice. We actually had enough, uh, points for both two on max value and two on range. That's very good. So the idea is we're going to try and get a photo of her right away and get a quick shot by 
walking into her. And then we're gonna run back, get another shot. Oh, this is... Oh, we are cooking! Oh, oh my goodness! Whoa! Woo! <laughs> Absolutely cooked. Uh, that was a good fight against the eye. That was perfect. Maybe not perfect, but like, close to. Uh, that's what I meant by some of these ghosts have a lot of health, and you're gonna see me absolutely decimate that health bar with quick shots. That was very good. Who is in front of the back? The solution to this puzzle is actually just so much more straightforward than you may think it is. Like, on a first casual playthrough, you might mess that up and then you'll be sitting there for ages. Alright, so now we have the mask. And this mask has specifically one place where we can use it. And it's gonna be all the way back in the very first room of the entire game. Which is the entrance to the mansion. And uh, if we get a ghost spawn here, that means we don't have to do the... Uh, the animation skip, but it seems like we're going to have to, because I don't hear any... Yeah, I don't hear any spawns. We're going to do the animation skip by opening the camera right on that second rope, which is going to skip uh, another rope falling from the ceiling and making Miko go, ah! and then she stands there for a couple of seconds. Because ropes are scary. Random ropes dangling in, in mansions in the middle of the forest filled with ghosts, that's scary. There's a lot of variables there, but yeah. So now that we've used the mask, we're actually going to take it back. Which is gonna be- you're gonna see me do that a lot on these doors. We're gonna be taking- we're gonna be putting in and taking out all of these masks. Here's the sad one. Or no, that's not the sad one. We're going to be picking up this extra sacred water just for, uh, for, for marathon safety. Take that mask back. We're going to put two of the masks up here. We're going to hang up the angry mask. We're going to hang up the joy mask. And then we're going to try and take this one. And trying to take this one will spawn one of the, uh, the ladies without the eyes. We're going to try and get the optimal fight here. This one sometimes is a little tricky. Yeah, okay. She decided to spawn behind me. That's okay. We're going to walk back and just take it slow. That fight could have been about maybe three or four seconds faster, but to be honest, having her teleport behind you isn't a bad thing. It's actually, like, one of the safest ways um, Uh, did I do this right? Yeah, I did this right. We're good. Uh, what was I gonna say? <laughs> what was I saying? I totally lost track. Anyways, we're gonna go pick up one of those puzzle pieces again so we can go to a door and we're gonna sit there for a little bit. Sometimes going slow is faster, yes. 
Yes, sure. Let's go with that. Last time I remember that she teleported behind you. Yeah, she teleports behind you, and that's actually better than her teleporting not behind you. If she teleports to, like, a different side of that room, then it's way worse. You lose way more time. Uh, X left? No. <laughs> X right. Oh, God. Muscle memory, you have failed me. As I said, press button. Sometimes I have to press more buttons. Because knowing the solution is not the speedrunner way. Just knowing how to press button is speedrunner way. Okay, so, this guy. This is the guy's husband. And he's upset because we cooked Yae pretty, <laughs> pretty good, so he's a little upset, understandably. Uh, he decided to teleport behind me, that, in this case, teleporting behind is not good. You don't want this guy to teleport behind you. We're gonna take a picture of him, we're gonna walk towards him to try and get a quick shot attempt. Didn't really work out, but we're gonna walk back, and we're gonna activate another quick shot opportunity and just finish him off. That was a bit slow, but pretty safe. We avoided getting damaged, which is good, because in this game, when you take damage, you take a lot of damage. This is a... A uh, very punishing game. Very, very punishing game. There are certain attacks in this game that will legitimately take half of your health bar away. And that's just that's just one attack. So you need to be very careful. Okay, so now we're going to put the happy mask back. Um, but we're going to have the, uh, like, the illusion mask. And that's just going to transform into... The mask of reflection is going to transform into whatever mask is supposed to be on that door. And that is actually how we're going to leave this area. So. Gotta take it back. and enter this room. And this room is what has the actual blinding mask in it. So the lady with no eyes, um, she was a part of the sacrifice um, and she wore the blinding mask. And uh, yeah, it punctures your eyes. Wonderful, I know. Um, I see you with the periphery shirt. Shoutouts to the boys in periphery. I saw them in November, and they put on a very good show. So now we do a little bit of backtracking. We're going to go back to that, uh, that weird, like, underground area with the big stones, and you have to climb down the two ladders. We're going to go all the way back there, and we're going to insert the blinding mask. But on our way there, we're going to fight a couple of ghosts. But uh, yeah, we're going to be chilling for a little bit. Wholesome family content, yeah. Make total destroy. Periphery 2. This time it's personal. Yeah, once you've uh, once you've left that area, you don't need to take the reflection mask back. You won't need to be entering any mask doors ever again. 
All you need is the blinding mask. Do I have time to take a sip of tea? I think so. Wonderful. Oh, this is a weird spawn. She's gonna, yeah, she's gonna poke me a little bit, and then we're just gonna be on our way. And we're gonna fight this guy again. And good start. Amazing start. Look at that. So that first fight, so in that big room where I got the Master of Reflection, we fought him. That first fight obviously didn't go very well. This fight, that's exactly how it's supposed to go. That's what you need. That's what you need. The tea sips. I do like my tea. Is your tea still hot? It's warm. It's not hot. I have been having far too much fun explaining Fatal Frame and talking about random things with all of you, lovely people. <laughs> Alright, last fight against, uh... Whoa! Okay. An odd choice by her, but okay. So this isn't actually too bad. This isn't too bad. The only the only reason why her teleporting doing like the the teleport behind you can be bad is that if you're too far against the wall behind you, she will be in the wall and you cannot take pictures of her at all. Uh, in this case, I wasn't too far back and I was able to still take pictures of her, so that teleport isn't the worst thing. Again, very random video game. It'd be cool if they made a next-gen Fatal Frame game. Considering how many big horror franchises are trying to make their way back into the modern age, you know, Dead Space and Alone in the Dark, Silent Hill, uh, I do think that Tecmo have put out some feelers by re-releasing Fatal Frame 4 and 5 for modern consoles and Steam, but I do think... Uh, I, I do think that maybe they still have their reservations of trying to make a brand new Fatal Frame game. Uh-oh. Alright, so these are the three stooges. Uh, there are three ghosts that spawn in this hallway at the beginning of this night, and only one stooge attacked us, which is good. Obviously, it's, it's, you know, the best outcome is that none of the Stooges attack, but if you're going to get attacked, hopefully it's only once, and that was only once. That's so true. So true. Insulated mugs, they are a thing. You'd love to see an HD remaster of the first three. I think that would, that would be fantastic. Because, as we mentioned earlier, that, that PSN store eventually is going to go down. And then uh, these games will only be available physically. And that's going to be a nightmare.
All right, so this is one of my favorite ghosts in the entire game. Uh, I call him Vape Cloud. Because look at him. He's literally a vape cloud. And the reason why he looks like this is because this ghost apparently is so old, he's just completely forgotten what he looks like. So, so he is just like... He's just an entity of smoke, mist, fog thing. And I think that's pretty funny. All right, we're going to go to type 14 film. We need 7k more points to get the extra max value. I don't know if we're going to be able to get that until the very end of the game. We'll see. Uh, but we're going to switch to the lower film because uh, we're going to take pictures of a couple of things. We don't want to waste too much of that type 37. That type 37 is very, very important, and I think we have about 30 of it left. Uh, which should be plenty, because our, our, I must admit, our film routing has been very, very good. Even though some of the fights haven't necessarily gone very quickly, they've all been in a minimal amount of shots, which is good. This is So, uh, in the story of Fatal Frame, the Calamity is what basically causes all of these people to, uh, to be killed, and why they're all ghosts that are not accepting of their death. And that's why they are ghosts, and why I have to exercise them with our camera and stuff. Uh, and, uh, one of the reasons why they're all dead is because of this guy that we're about to spawn in a moment. One of the, uh, the headmasters. of the Himuro Mansion family. <laughs> the Calamity, aka Big Oopsie Uh-Oh. Precisely. That is, that is kind of what it is. So for this fight, we're, uh, we're going to go ahead and switch to our Type 74. Not Type 70, like I said earlier. Type 74 is what it is, to be exact. Because uh, this guy is... Uh, he's got a pretty good amount of health, and he's very dangerous if you let him kind of do his thing. Missed shot already. Okay, we're getting one there. We need one more before we tr start trying to quick shot him. He's doing some weird movement. Okay, I think... Oh, he's going to laugh? He's laughing? I'm exercising his soul and he's laughing? There we go, got him. You laughed. That's actually very good RNG. Um, even though he was giving me very strange movement and it took me a while to like actually start doing damage to him consecutively, he did start laughing. And that just gives you a completely free quick shot on him. And just like we did that animation skip earlier with the dropping rope, we're going to do another with the lightning strike here. Oh, well, I attempted to. I think I quite literally pressed circle the frame that that happened. So, oops. Oh, well. As you can see, it's only like a couple seconds. Uh-oh. I really gotta- I gotta make notes on these puzzles one day, man. There they are, um... Oh my goodness. Uh... Do you, uh, need the answer to this one or no? Uh, eventually I'll get it. It'll be fine. <laughs> I just... Well, I have them written down somewhere. Let's see if I can find them before you get it. Go for it. Alright, ready? Yeah. 
Top left, bottom middle, bottom right, top right, bottom left, top left, bottom middle. That was a bit. That was a bit fast, Mister Dices. Oh wait. Uh, all right, ready? Yes. Okay. Top left. Bottom middle. Bottom right. Top right. Bottom left. Top left. Bottom middle. Thank you. I wrote down all these puzzles a while back because I hate these puzzles. Yeah, same. Uh, like when you're when you're like grinding out PBs, you don't even think. When you do those puzzles, you just don't think. You just press the buttons and you do them. Happy to help. And then I yeah. also wrote down the final door, which is I can write them down in weird like what I remember them from. But I think you probably remember that one better. Uh, one, three, four, seven. You use numbers. I use I use like symbols. Oh. That's smarter. Well, funny enough, on on the Xbox version of Fatal Frame, they're numbers. <laughs> also makes sense. So they changed that because they realized, like, hmm, maybe not everybody in North America understands kanji. Happy to help. Yes, thank you, thank you. All right, so we just took four pictures. These four pictures are going to reveal four ghosts. Uh, and they are all the, uh, they're all the priests, like, not the head priest, but, like, the, the, the priests that serve the headmaster or whatever. Uh, and we are going to go fight the first one, which is going to be in this kind of, like, pond area. Uh, and we're not going to be using type 37. We're actually going to be using the type 74 on this ghost specifically, because he likes to float everywhere like he, he's extremely like quick and likes to strafe and he's uh he's he's definitely been playing some tekken he's sidestepping all over the place let's see what he does okay he's actually gonna push forward okay there's the strafe here comes the strafing He's not changing direction yet. Oh. He's stopping? Incredible. Okay. What a homie. What a homie. He decided to play nice. Cool. Alright, now we're going to switch back to our Type 37. And we're gonna fight the priest in the courtyard here, right where we fought Yae. Yeah, these priests are, um... They're hard. They're hard, because some of their, some of their uh, movements and their attacks are, like, kind of hard to track. So... Let's see if this one's nice, too. They might all end up being really cool tonight. Okay, he's gonna walk forward. Okay, he's not gonna reveal himself yet. His, they, so, the thing about the priests is that they don't have their, like, heads attached correctly, so, like, the gimmick is that they hide their head. And that's the only part of them that you can take the picture of, so, like, yeah. Bit of a gimmick there. He didn't give me the best patterns. Um, but we were able to do quite a bit of damage and just take him out safely. Yeah, you can you can hear him. He says, where's my head? He lost it. It's not a good thing to lose. You need that. All right, we're not going to go into that room just yet. We're actually going to go... We're actually... No, 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 no. You know what? No, 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 no. We are going to do that. We are going to do this first. I was going to go do the water room first because there's a chance that a ghost appears there. An extra one. And uh, it's nice to have a little bit of extra film 
for that just in case, but you know what? We're, we're fine. We're fine. We got plenty of film. This runs, uh, like I said, the, the film routing has been very good this run. Now, this guy likes to strafe. That last guy doesn't strafe too often. This guy does like to strafe, though. Yep. Right off the bat. Man strafing. Okay, we're gonna walk into him so we can get a quick shot, and then we're gonna walk back. Get another quick shot, he's gonna keep strafing. Boom, done. So that's the good thing about strafing, is that you can get quick shots off of the strafing, because you're, you're switching his animation from the idle strafe animation to the attack animation. So you can bait the attack, walk backwards, bait the idle animation, go back in. You can string up quick shots like that. Um, it's definitely the safest way of doing the priest's fights in general. Uh, there is a slightly faster strat that you can do that involves... Um, baiting a specific attack that'll give you a zero shot, but I don't really need to be doing that at, at this current moment. Definitely had some sick moves. The the, the Pond Priest and the, the Courtyard Priest usually don't strafe as much as that guy does. That guy strafes all a lot. Okay, we did not get the extra ghost spawn, which is fantastic. Because fighting two ghosts at the same time in this room is not very ideal. It's hard to get quick shots off of this ghost specifically. I don't think anyone really in the Fatal Frame community has cracked the code on this ghost because she just doesn't seem to switch animations as much as the other ghosts do. But she does, she does kind of just hang around. She doesn't do a whole lot, and she doesn't do, she doesn't do a ton of damage either, so she's not very dangerous. Not a big deal. But now we're coming up to our last priest. Who is going to be... Uh, in this garden area. I think this is what it's called, the garden area. And this guy... This priest likes to do this, like, flying body slam T-pose thing. <laughs> I, I... <laughs> that sounds so dumb, but, like, just trust me, it's... it's... He, he, that's what he does. We have enough points now, finally. For, uh for level 3 max value on our shots, which is great. That's going to come in handy on the uh, some of the final fights come up here. That's fine. Okay. There it is! There it is! The T-Pose body slam thing that I was talking about. <laughs> it looks ridiculous, because it is ridiculous. Okay, now he's being silly. Now he's being silly. Look at him. Hey! Oh. Hey, that was cheeky! My goodness, get out of here already. There we go, okay. That guy's a trickster. He's got the silliest attack in the game, and he's a bit of a trickster. Now we're on our way to uh, that room where we uh, 
took those four pictures to spawn the four priests, and we're going to solve that puzzle. But after we're done solving that puzzle, we are going to have one last ghost fight to do, and it is against the uh, the head priest, the master, with his big old sword. Uh, and in that fight, he has quite a lot of health, and we're going to be using the Type 90 film. And uh, if he's nice, then he will probably not even have a chance to attack. We won't even really let him play the game, which would be awesome. But there is a chance that he'll his teleporting will be a little bit chaotic. Which is probably something you've noticed already, that in this run, ghosts have very strange behavior, and one of those strange behaviors is just randomly teleporting to different parts of the room and or behind you. Take a picture of that, that's gonna spawn the master. Now we're gonna hunt him down. In theory, it should only take about six shots. So we have plenty of Type 90 film. Or not Type 90, uh, Type 74. Fatal Frame 1 and 2 have different uh, film types, and I keep on thinking of Fatal Frame 2s. The blood trail is what leads us to his final fight. And we're we're like so safe right now too, by the way. We still have our um our stone mirror, which prevents us from dying if, even if we hit zero health. We got two sacred waters. I mean we are we're good. If this guy decides to go all in, then like we're ready. Bring it on. All right, here we go. Let's see what he's doing. Cool. He's in the middle. Still in the middle. Still in the middle. Look at him. Okay, he's being cool. Okay, what is he going to do now? He's going to charge, which is fine. That's... That's strange. He... Okay, remember how I said there's, like, attacks that absolutely decimate you in this game? That was one of them. And the crazy thing is, is that he animation cancelled his charge into that attack, and if I didn't have my stone mirror, that would have been GG's. So yeah, there are some ghost fights that are so dangerous, but it's okay. I got him back. I got him back. I quickshotted the absolute heck out of him afterwards. You deplete my health quick, I deplete your health quick. And that was the last fight of the third night. Now we're moving on to the fourth night, which is the final night. And uh, we're going to have only a few things to do, really. Oh, yeah. That was that was some serious dash canceling right there for sure. Okay, put in the master seal. Reveal the uh, secret tunnel. Get the mirror piece, and that is it. That is night three. Final night. Gonna play some Koto sheet music. Unlock this door, and now we're going towards uh, like a, a very strange looking trick in this game. This is the only time this is relevant, 
Uh, when you're, like, standing on top of these wooden beams, um, you walk very slowly. But, uh, if you, if you hold the run button and then let go of it and then hold it again constantly, like, in a rhythmic fashion, not, not mashing, uh, you can make Miku kind of, like, glide forward and it's way faster than just walking. I just call it putting her heelys on. So this is the this is the heely tech. Let's see if I can get it just right. Yeah, that's good. You see that? The sweet heely tech. There's the type 90 film. It's not type 0, it's type 90. That's why I was getting confused earlier. But yeah, look at that. Sweet heely tech. And that's the only time you ever use it in the game. <laughs> cool. And now something that I haven't really mentioned... Uh, is uh, in Fatal Frame games, when the screen goes black and white, that means you are in danger of being killed in one shot. This is a one-hit kill scenario. If Kyrie catches up to you, you are dead. Uh, and in some of the other spots that you've seen me in a black and white screen, it'll be the end of the chapter, which means it's okay if Kyrie catches you. In fact, it's faster. That's why I've ran into her every time. But this time, if you run into Kyrie, you just straight up die, and you're done. It's game over. So this is one of those times where black and white is very bad. You need to get out of there. Uh, but this is a very common thing in the Fatal Frame series. It, it's in multiple games. Screen goes black and white. You are in serious danger. Now we are in the actual, like, secret tunnel where the the ritual really takes place. The caves towards the ritual. Uh, do we have the right film? Yes. Can we upgrade range? No. Thought so. Okay. Okay. Ooh! Is this a double kill? Oh, not quite. That was really good damage, and we, we got really good damage and killed one of them. And now the other one... We're probably gonna... Oh, we did get the double kill! We did get the double kill! That was sick! <laughs> that was so sick, dude. Oh, man. Yeah, that's like as fast as that fight pretty much gets. Is getting the double kill with the type uh, the type seventy four film. Man, that was sick. That's what you like to see. So those ghosts I call dumb and dumber because they're dumb. They are really just dumb and dumber, and they do really dumb movements and waste a lot of time. Unless you get a sick fight like I just did. Now we're gonna get a rope shrine maiden real quick before she even has a chance to move around. And now, we're going to switch to the Type 90 film, finally. And we're going to be using that on a, a ghost uh, right here, which is the Rope Shrine Maiden, but she's, she's in, like, her not giving up state, you know? She's like, no, come back. Look at her. She's fast, too. She's, she is crawling quite quickly. And that's it. Now we got nine film for the final fight in the game, which is Kyrie. Now, as I mentioned before, in the black and white sequence, when you touch Kyrie, you die. 
And that is just how it is, even in this fight, when it's fully colored and it's the boss fight, if she touches you, it's game over. So you have to be extremely careful at this point. I know, speedruns where the final boss is a one-hit kill is, is, is pretty nerve-wracking, but... There is a consistent way of doing this fight. And we th I think I got it already. I think Kyrie gave me the, the good pattern. Yeah, she for sure did. Let's go. Let let's go. Th this fight is so scary if she doesn't give you this pattern. It is like... Yeah, it's brutal. She can waste so much time. And she can waste so much of your zero film. Or 90 film, which is very important to doing this fight quickly. Here we go. Time's coming up. Right now. Time, dude. Let's go. And that's Fatal Frame. Good stuff. Thank you. Um, I will say, uh, there's. I've ran this game so much, and like I've competed for world record and whatnot. So even though I'm kind of rusty, there's a lot of there's a lot of really really optimal things I was able to show off. Goodness. Uh, which the most important ones being the ghost fights. They're very random. Uh, they take a lot of improv. You need just knowledge of the game. You need a lot of Fatal Frame running is just playing the game so much to know exactly what you should do in the situation of a ghost giving you a weird pattern. Um, so this run was definitely a good showcase of that because I was able to react and apply my knowledge to a lot of the fights where I got weird patterns and uh, also show off some really quick ones, especially that Yai fight. Uh, that was buttery smooth. So yeah, solid Good run. Stuff, yeah. Uh, as well, really quick while we are watching the ending here, if anyone wanted to check out more of you and possibly more Fatal Frame or other horror games, where can they check you out? Uh, yeah, I mean, I do, I do stream full time. twitchtv slash Um, I run a lot of games. Not, like, an absolute ton, but quite a, quite a lot of games. Um, currently, I'm working on Resident Evil 1 Remake because I'd like to get back into the top three spot. Um, that's, like, my current PB project. Uh, but on the weekends, you can just catch me running a ton of different games and marathons. Um, everything from, you know, Resident Evil Silent Hill, this game, uh, you know, Fear, Dead Rising, um... Granny, if you're a Nanthology enjoyer from from AGDQ just a few weeks back, you know. If you like that run, yeah, I, I do that pretty often. Um, just a bunch of stuff. Not even just horror either. Just, I cover a lot of genres. So yeah, follow me there, I guess, if you want to see any of that. Good stuff. Thank you again for doing the run. Fatal Frame is always a good showing. We haven't seen it in quite a while, so thank you for showing it off. Yeah, thank you for having me. I was happy to show off Fatal Frame. It's a great series, so. Yeah, and yeah. also thank you for uh, rolling with some of the punches that we had today. We definitely a bit of a <laughs> weird mix-up in the middle of today's show, so I do want to thank yeah. you personally for that. I mean, you and I, you and I both run a lot of games. I think we had some good solutions on the backup. Absolutely, and I do want to thank you again for uh, being flexible. <laughs> Could hear her uh, that being said, once again, if you have not uh, checked them out yet, you can find the link in Twitch chat, twitch.tv slash maxiloves. You can check them out there with a lot of fun horror content. Uh, that being said, that wraps up our show for the night. It has been another episode of Speedruns from the Crypt. We'll be back in about two weeks with more horror games. I've been your host, Dysis. I plan a lot of these shows, and I hope that you've enjoyed uh, this kind of look into the horror block of GDQ. We'll get back to some more thematic shows as we go on this year. But I do want to say thank you once again for watching, and hope you have a wonderful rest of the day and or night. So... Uh, once again, if you want to hear more about how I run the crypt or just myself in general, you can find me at twitch.tv slash uh, Twitter and all that jazz. I tend to talk a lot about how these shows work. 
Uh, anyway, thank you all for watching. Have a wonderful rest of the day or night, and take it easy.